It's time for Twit This Week in Tech bombshell show for you. We got a great show. And it all starts with great panelists. Amy Webb, our favorite futurist, is back. Jill Duffy from PC Magazine and someone brand new I've been trying to get on the show for years. Taylor Lawrence from the Washington Post, where she covers show social. She's got a brand new book out. We'll talk about that. The bombshell revelations in the new Walter Isaacson biography of Elon Musk. And it's trial day for Amazon and Google. The FTC and the Department of Justice, respectively, coming down on big tech and a trigger warning for the following show there is mention of self-harm if you or anyone in your family is suffering there's no need to suffer in silence please get some help there are great people waiting to hear from you at the suicide prevention hotline 988 and now on with the show podcasts you love from people you trust this is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 944, recorded Sunday, September 10th, 2023. Schilling Spawn Con. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash twit for three extra months free with a one-year package. expressvpn.com slash twit. And by Duo. Protect against breaches with a leading access management suite providing strong, multi-layered defenses to only allow legitimate users in. For any organization concerned about being breached, and in need of a solution fast, Duo quickly enables strong security and improves user productivity. Visit cs.co slash twit today for a free try. And by Nureva. It's a first. Nureva's new Pro Series, the HDL310 for large rooms and HDL410 for extra large rooms, gives you uncompromised audio and systems that are incredibly simple to set up, manage, and deploy at scale. Learn more at Nareva.com slash twit. And by ACI Learning. ACI's new cyber skills is training that's for everyone, not just the pros. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discount is based on the size of your team, and when you fill out the form, you'll receive a proper quote tailored to your needs. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. I have a power panel for you today. I'm very excited. From PC Magazine, Jill Duffy returns. She has also returned to the U.S. Welcome back to our shores, stranger. Thank you very much. She is still the author of the Everything Guide to Remote Work, however, because you never know where work will take her. She's also a regular on PC Magazine, both in software and her Get Organized column. It's good to see you again. Thank it's you. It's been way it's too nice long. To be here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also with us, I'm always thrilled to have her on, Amy Webb, futurist, sprint bicyclist, CEO of Future Today Institute. And for you, Amy, I have brought the books. Nice. There like is. It. The signals are talking. Why today's yeah. fringe is tomorrow's mainstream. There is... The Big Nine, how the Tech Titans and their... Th oh, it fell off. And the Tech Titans are <laughs> warping humanity with their thinking machines, which is really about AI now that I think about it. It and is. that. Oh, sorry. Plug the third one and then you I You were always that. ahead of the a game a little bit. The new one is about biotech, the Genesis mm -hmm. machine, our quest to rewrite life in the age of synthetic biology. Yeah, so the scenarios in the second book, The Big Nine, uh, which I wrote now eight years ago, are all sort of coming true as much as a scenario comes through, they're sort of happening the way that I spelled a it lot of it out. It was a little out. prescient, and, uh, which I guess for a futurist is just another day's work, but. Well, the point was to get people aware of what the future might look like, alternative views and, you know, choose the best one. We just chose not to choose the best one, I guess. So here we are. That's pretty much given. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's always going to be that way. I think this was published in 2019. Artificial intelligence is poised to forever change the course of human history. If we had only read this. If only. If only. If only. Yep. Um, it's on my 
bedside table right now. You know what else is on my bedside table? And I would hold the book up, but I can't because all I have is a PDF. Taylor Lorenz is here. Her new book comes out October 19th. Ex no, October 3rd. October 3rd. Oh, yay. I still only have a PDF. Extremely online. Hello, Taylor. I got to get you a hard copy. Oh, I have so many. That's okay. I read it on my um, uh, iPad mini. And it was great. In fact, I underlined a bunch of stuff, and then I found out that iBooks does not export those in any form or fashion that I can use today. So I'm just going to have to go from memory. But anyway, I'm thrilled to have you, and it's a great book. And I actually uh, finished it last night. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. Um, it, well, it's what's funny is uh, it's a recent history, really. It's about the creator, the f beginnings and uh, current status of the creator economy. and the attention economy and every bit of it I'm reading, I'm going, Oh, I remember, oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that. But I'd forgotten so much of it. <laughs> it's like every, you know, it's the life of a mayfly for most of these influencers. Like they rise, they're huge, they fall. Uh, and in fact, the thing I took away from it mostly was, and I, maybe this was the conclusion you wanted me to take away was uh, don't depend on a platform because they're going to pull that rug right out from under you, whether it's Twitter, Vine, God, the Vine story was amazing. Um, Thank you. I, I'm i trying to get that one excerpted because it's my favorite story in the book. So, Well, and of course, we covered all this, but I didn't know the inside stuff that you knew. For instance, I, hadn't, I didn't realize Twitter bought Vine before it went public. I thought they mm -hmm. bought it after it was a hit. I knew they mm -hmm. killed it, but they didn't really kill it because it was... It was the creators that killed it. It was just a great story. It's a fascinating story. And... Um, kind of an uh there's a strong moral there that everyone who wants to be an influencer should follow closely because you live and by the company, yeah tech companies should learn how to deal with their users that's they right Vine and Th twitter famously been terrible at that they couldn't have mismanaged it worse to be honest but i don't know what if they had it's also interesting uh I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I'll get to you in a second. <laughs> I just, I'm, it's fresh in my mind. I want to ask Taylor a couple of questions. I, uh, it's also interesting how sometimes companies' business models get in the way of doing the right thing. Snapchat's a good example where they really resisted. They wanted to be a personal communication app, not a creator's app, you know, a media app. And so they split it off. They just didn't handle it well. Yeah. I know, and I think that hindered their growth, and now they're not. And we I, often think that Instagram killed them, but I think it's just as much the case that they killed themselves. They're not dead, but injured themselves by their uh, unwillingness to recognize what was going on. And yet, at the same time, I kind of honor the fact that they said, well, no, because we want to be an app for people to communicate with each other, not to broadcast. And I kind of that's yeah. kind of cool, too. You see that Clubhouse is trying to make a comeback as of yeah, like yesterday? Yeah, she talks about It's Clubhouse happening, too. Leo. It's hap Taylor, Leo. They're it's pivoting. Happening. They're pivoting. So Clubhouse, pivoting which, which was really big because of COVID, right, was doing those audio. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What do you mean by really big? Well, yeah. they, weren't they huge? I mean, depends yeah. on how you define huge. Everybody was on it. Elon me. Okay, well, there you go. You, you had <laughs> the it. The fire festival. Uh, we were all there. <laughs> no, they had a bunch of tech people there. They did. And they had a bunch. And actually, it's very funny because I, I was in Atlanta when they rolled out the suggested user list, which, by the way, was just half of their investors. They were force feeding their and recent Horowitz partners. And I was at this content house in Atlanta and they were all like really hyped on Clubhouse, but they were like, it's really annoying. You're forced to follow these like I think I included this in my book. Like you're forced to follow these like old, weird, white, like <laughs> men and you have to get past that. And then you can find people. And I'm like, this app is so doomed because they were. I do not want to follow Mark Andreessen. I do not. I do not. In fact, he did. Uh, you're right. I remember now he led all, a lot of the original clubhouses and uh, they're doing it again. Andreessen Horowitz, they seem that's like, that's their MO when they, when they, you know, invest in a company, suddenly it's, it's the Andreessen Horowitz company. It's very interesting. The content was really crappy too. I mean, I, I oh, listened awful. into you yeah. and it was just like, I, I think pe the work that you do on all of your programming, Leo, and have been doing for so many years, I just, I don't think people appreciate, you make it seem very easy, very conversational, but nobody has any idea what happens on the back end and all the prep. You can't just 
get a bunch of randos together and try to have a panel there talk. There was some it's interest. Like the worst possible. There was some interesting stuff. For instance, and I bet you appreciated this. You were hearing, we were hearing from people in China uh, were getting on Clubhouse and talking freely in a way that you wouldn't yeah. normally hear them talk. So in the earliest days, I would go, I would join these like Chinese chats where they were speaking in English sometimes. And, sure, uh, I mean, that's those are edge cases. You got to hear voices you wouldn't normally right. hear, but it's just... Like that's, chat roulette didn't work out either because right. of all the reasons. That's you know. kind of the story of social yeah. <laughs> in a way is, uh, and it's, it's as an old guy watching this, I was really excited in the early days of the internet. You, I think you even make a, a reference to this in the book, Taylor, uh, about the, how it was going to democratize things. You talk about gatekeepers getting out of the way and everybody would have a voice. We all thought this was going to be transformational a revolution. I, I, 18 years ago, I started a podcast network. The idea, I didn't, I don't need to be working on the radio or the TV anymore. I could do it myself. And I thought that it was transformational. But then people arrived. And people always mess it up. <laughs> really? And corporations. Yeah. Like, corporations probably, are people. They're made of people. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's if you want to read in a way that you can kind of put it all together instead of the you know the glimpses that we get in the normal course of events how all of this has happened over the last 15 years. This is a great book to read. Extremely online. It will be out October. You said 3rd? Yes, but it's available for pre-order now. So you can pre-order it right now and it'll be on your doorstep October 3rd. Extremelyonlinebook.com and it's a fast read because you go, oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, I remember that. So what is Clubhouse doing now, Amy? What is their pivot? They say friends over followers. I, who, I, you know what, Leo? I can't. I can't. <laughs> Do you care? Is even, my answer to, is to question. your question. Yeah. Well, there's people's um, heads bouncing around on the web page. Uh, okay, so it's like it's like obnoxious pong. I don't know. I, <laughs> can I move um, them around? No, I can't yeah. interact with them. I can just, they just keep. Um, I, I didn't get any insight or joy out of any clubhouse sessions I ever attended. Really? And okay. I'm not sure, like to, to your point about it's people, um, you have, you have to be able to make good content. So the technology isn't enough. You have to know what to do once you get there. And there's a whole bunch of people that are just like, if it winds up being a mouthpiece for somebody's latest investment round or app or whatever it might be, you know, I'll tell you, I was actually with Mark Andreessen two weekends ago in the Hamptons. He's a fascinating, very, very interesting guy. That is a great humble brag, by the way. You know, <laughs> when we were in the Hamptons a couple You know what I mean. Ago. All right. <laughs> well, I'm not that person. But I know, I know, I know. I'm I slightly to, that person. I, I had to tease you a little bit. He, he's... Uh, um, He's super, super interesting. He is super, super smart. Um, so I, I'm, I'm confused as to why sometimes these decisions get made. I think probably it has more to do with a communications team than anything else. Well, let's not forget, though, that Mark Andreessen was co-hosting, hosting, pushing out to his millions of followers rooms with Holocaust denier Chuck C. Johnson, a room saying that I needed to be hanged, um, a room- When you say that, I, you mean I, Taylor Lorenz, need to be hanged. Oh, yeah, Taylor Lorenz and other journalists that should be hung. Jeez. Let's not forget, you know, all the other rooms that Mark Andreessen participated in with neo-Nazis, with, um, you know, far-right info wards people, with that Alex the God guy. I think, I I don't have as much, I, I think he's a very fascinating person, I agree, Amy. And I would mm -hmm. love to- have a conversation with him one day, but I think he used Clubhouse to push a very specific ideology that I'm glad he doesn't have that audience anymore, to be honest. Yeah, yeah you're not wrong. I think a lot of these guys are fascinating, very, very, very smart, but maybe a little, I don't know, sociopathic, a little bit detached from the real human <laughs> experience of normal humans or something. And then a lot of the times, I'm thinking of Elon as well, they, they say, well, you know, Either I was just joking or it was just, you know, ironic or, well, you got to let everybody talk. But, you know, I don't believe in this stuff. Elon says, I'm not an anti-Semite. I don't know if he's anti-Semitic or he's so desperate at this point to juice the traffic <laughs> on the network. I really honestly. Fully cynical. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I got uh, some of the stuff that's being said. 
I mean, I think people who listen to the show at this point know I'm Jewish and I just can't stomach what oh, I've, I don't blame what I've you. been seeing. Yeah. I mean, even if it is just in the name of a, a last ditch desperation attempt to get advertising back. Well, you know, Amy, as you were saying, like to put together a podcast is hard. You have mm -hmm. to organize it. You have to have topics. You have to have people who are booking guests on the show. You have to arrange it. You have to be, have people who know how to interrupt one another once they're on your show. Media is hard. And I think a lot of a lot of the people who are getting into it now because of the low barrier of entry, right? It's not television networks anymore. It's just, just everything is open. Um, they don't know that media is hard and nothing has ever been hard for them. They've had money, they've had privilege, they've had support, they've had a network of people who have helped them along. And they don't know that media is just as big as any other field where you have to know what you're doing. You have to understand the ethics of it. You have to know how to work with people. You have to know what your messaging sounds like to the people who are receiving it. And they just kind of brush that aside and say, oh no, it's just a person, you know, a platform with people talking. That's all it is, it's fine. Like it's hard work to do. Well, I think there's another piece of this and that is, I think this generation of tech oligarchs represent sort of different pockets of monarchies we've seen throughout history who truly believe at some point that their message matters above everything else and people are clamoring to hear the next few things. Um, and I, you know, I wonder if that's just the place that we've arrived. L'état c'est moi, uh, as uh, Louis said. Um, you actually talk a little bit about this, Taylor, in the book about how one of the reasons Vine and maybe TikTok and others have succeeded is because it wasn't prepared, polished media. It was authentic. Uh, musically worked because people were, you know, weren't wearing makeup. They were just lip syncing uh, to songs. So there is a hunger for authenticity. Yeah, I think that's been sort of the defining characteristic of online content, even with bloggers too. It was like, oh, here's people speaking in this you know, interesting tone and voicey, you know, posting. And obviously that's been more and more sort of the case. Yeah, you like start, which is, I loved, you start with blogs and mommy blogs and with Deuce, Heather Armstrong, who passed away just a few months ago. Uh, and it's yeah. kind of a tragic uh, story, but I loved reading her stuff. And the reason- I don't, I don't I don't know that story. What's the, who is, so, so I'm not, it's a mommy blog. So it was what, one of the first it? mommy blog. You're too young to remember this. In fact, you're all too young to remember this, but yep, yep. in the early That's days. That's a good, keep saying that, Leo. That's good. <laughs> in the early days of blogging. <laughs> uh, uh, women who were talented, uh, smart people, but who got, in the case of Heather Armstrong, married young, had a child young and had to stop working were you know frustrated at home as a mommy and Armstrong started blogging about stuff that nobody had written about before because it was so unpolished you know cleaning up a uh, spit up and uh, you know uh, you know f finding a way to get out of bed before noon and and it and she liked her wine <laughs> and it was it was it was brutally honest and was very authentic and it, and it happened to be hysterical she was really a good writer and there were a whole bunch of people like this who uh, they became, mommy blog is a terrible, you know, f obviously phrase to use, but that's what it ended up being called. Um, but what it really was was some very talented women who were underutilized in the, in the regular world and so found a way to find a voice in uh, the new media. And it worked and it was great. But her story was sad. She struggled with mental illness uh, and depression. Um, did you get to talk to her at all before her death, Taylor, or? Yeah, yeah, and I had met her like years ago when I went to blog her. Um, blog the, her, I, man! Her, yeah, you must have been twelve oh, wow. at blog her. Blast from the past. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you must have been. Oh no, I. Well, I was a blogger. You know, that's how I got my start. Was what I, was her name? Lisa. Who started blog her? Lisa. Remind me. Two. Or there were two women or four women. They're in. They were book. both. They were. They were both Lisas. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. I can't remember there was Lisa Stone blogging. and Jory uh, Desjardins, right? Oh, oh, and Elisa yeah. Camelhart Page, who I know very well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how yeah. could I forget Elisa? Yeah. They were like Silicon Valley. Yeah. This is this is this is fifteen years this ago. This is like early this is like ago. early two thousands, yeah. 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 I went I went, by the way, I went to blog her. By the time I went to blog her, I think it was two thousand nine or twenty ten, but it was later. 
um, because I was running, I I was doing a bunch of blog stuff, but Heather, Amy, I mean, it's worth rereading and I quote some of it in my book, but when Heather first put ads, she was one of the first mommy bloggers to really effectively monetize her, her personal brand. She put ads on her blog in 2004 and it was like, it was huge controversy. I actually remember it when I, I was obviously still in school, but I remember like the drama on the internet because everyone was like, how dare you? Like, you know, you're writing about your life and your children and you want to monetize that, which is like so funny because of course that's all anybody does online now is monetize every aspect of their life. But she, well, and then she struggled with addiction and she passed away recently. She committed suicide. Mm, it's mm. very tragic. And um, I think we have to give a, a trigger warning at that point and tell people that there is hope out there and please don't do what Heather did, uh, but call the suicide hotline, which now has a great new number. What is it? Is it 88? 988. 988. Please do that for us. Uh, yeah, I, it, it broke my heart because uh, she was so funny and so kind of <laughs> snide and <laughs> sarcastic and just, she was great. Um, uh, Anyway. Isn't there a new mommy blogger that just got arrested or something for... Oh, Lord, there's a story. The Utah yeah. mommy blogger who was taping her children down with duct tape. I, I sadly read this in page six, so that's my access to... That's pathetic, but that's where I saw this. And Her 12-year-old uh, escaped. This happened this week. Escaped through Jesus. a window. Uh, he had duct tape around his uh, ankles. Went to a neighbor... And said, please uh, call the police. I'm uh, being held. Uh, upon arrival, the police said, notice the child had wounds, was malnourished. They took him to a hospital and then investigated. And uh, There was, was another kid, Ruby too, or Frankie. something, right? Yeah, Ruby. Yo, the whole family. There was she, a daughter, too. She was, sadly, yeah. she was doing a blog about being a great mommy. But that's, she you know, was, these things happen. She was a what do you, I mean? Well, she was a YouTuber too. I, I mean, it's very sad because I think there's so much vitriol right now towards moms on the internet already. And I think like these stories are used to kind of attack other moms that well, are Well, this doing. wouldn't be the first time. I mean, that's the other th absolute through thread in the book. And you've been the victim of misogyny and abuse online. And almost every time, especially if you're a woman, in fact, almost exclusively if you're a woman, if you stick your head up, there are assholes out there and evil men who will really take shots at you. And we, you know, we've had Brianna Wu on regularly. She was one of the first victims of Gamergate. Ironically, as you point out, Gamergate isn't gone. They just became the alt-right. Mm. Yeah. All right. Now I made everybody sad. I'm sorry. But uh, they're actually, uh, I usually I save obituaries for the end of the show. So I, there's a couple more and we'll save them. Um, but we are at that stage, I guess, of, uh, of technology where a lot of the early people are uh, now leaving us, sad to say. Let's talk about something happy. How about this? Walter Isaacson's biography of Elon Musk is due to come out on Tuesday, but we've already seen a number of excerpts. In one of them... By the way, one of them, which Isaacson is now sort of retracting, Isaacson says that Elon disconnected Starlink to prevent the Ukraine uh, drone strike on Russia because he was afraid of a nuclear war. This we never knew about. We knew that Elon had, uh, you know, was upset about... Uh, the cost of Starlink and so forth. But in this case, he was actually making U.S., in effect, making U.S. policy. And there was a lot of outcry over this. Let me find the... Um, Rightfully so. Yeah. Isaacson, I'm a little concerned about this book, actually. Right, wait, the, I just want to clarify. The outcry, the rightfully so outcry, sh should be the entire planet being very concerned that Elon Musk is negotiating geopolitical agreements. Yes, that, that's the outcry. Perfect. And by the way, my my friends at State did not share Elon's ridiculous concern. So th this is financial. Um, and to be fair, we kind of got ourselves into this situation. But, you know, the, the geopolitical grid is shifting and technology plays a, a role in the future of how relationships are formed and wars are fought. 
And we should be asking ourselves a question. What does it mean when a corporation is making decisions in geopolitical space or geoeconomic space, um, intervening on behalf of maybe without even the permission of another country should scare the absolute hell out of you. Uh, and we shouldn't be supporting that Yeah, in any way. Uh, so, by the way, Brianna Wu, who speak of the devil, tweeted, uh, for all you mansplainers who said I was wrong when I said the uh, U.S. government should not cede its responsibility with NASA to private industry, told you so. Uh, but that's what a lot of this comes from, is the, the, the government's letting stuff be privatized, like space. And as a result, you have, uh, and New York Times had a very good piece on this a couple of weeks ago, we talked about it, Elon Musk uh, wielding great geopolitical power just because he controls Starlink. This is uh, from CNBC. Isaacson's book claims that Musk and SpaceX ordered engineers to shut off Starlink satellite network over Crimea last year in order to disrupt a Ukrainian military initiative. Uh, Musk had, of course, initially provided Starlink to the Ukraine military for free and then soured on the deal because it was costing him, he said, $400 million a year. And then he also said, according to the book, Starlink was not meant to be involved in wars. Um, now, Isaacson's backed down a bit on this. Ronan Farrow also has something in oh, the New Yorker a couple of weeks piece. ago. So yes. I mean, it's just which, which which has a very different viewpoint on on all of this. And I tend to believe what I read in the New Yorker over and and a, and a reference to having just a private ass conversation with Putin, which is yeah. terrifying. Yeah, more yeah. than one. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Farrow intimates that Musk might have been talking to Putin weekly. Yeah, uh, that is terrifying. Uh, Isaacson on Friday, xed. I'm not going to call it Twitter. Xed. To clarify on the Starlink issues, see, he's really backpedaling on this because it was very clear in the book. The Ukrainians thought the coverage was enabled all the way to Crimea, but it was not. They asked Musk to enable it for their drone sub attack on the, uh, the Russian fleet. Musk did not enable it because he thought probably correctly this would cause a major war. Remember, Isaacson is writing an authorized biography of Elon Musk. So I feel like there were back channels involved in this retraction. What, what do we say about this? I think you said it. I guess you said it all, really. Uh, it's, uh, Amy, it's, um, we should not, our our policy well, our, listen, there's, should not there's be a determined couple... by some billion, crazy billionaire. So there's several things happening at once. Um, the way that conflict, first of all, uh, nobody thought, everybody thought that Putin would win and nobody expected Ukraine to to sort of push forward and, and keep things going as long as they have. So munitions weren't prepared, intelligence system, like not, nobody was really prepared for what wound up happening. And, you know, this is delicate. There are geopolitical alliances and the world being sort of reordered um, in ways that could be precarious going forward. So the United States can't just send, or at that point, couldn't just send a bunch of stuff, not to mention procurement takes a long time. You know, so keeping the internet on was important, but it looks like Elon kind of went it alone. And again, like we should be asking ourselves what role either individuals or technology companies should be playing in the future of strategic relationships between countries um, because these are not public utilities. These are companies that are public. So, so they have a fiduciary responsive, you know, there's a fiduciary responsibility there that, that has to be, you know, has to be observed. So it, it just changes the nature of, of what's happening. But Elon knows that he can skate, but he's gotten away with murder. Uh, figuratively in the past, maybe literally. Well, depending on whose story you believe, those satellites went offline for a while and left a bunch of people yeah. stranded. And a uh, lot of people died. Ukrainian advisor to Zelensky, Mikhailo uh, Podolyak, wrote, by not allowing Ukrainian drones to, drones to destroy part of the Russian military fleet via Starlink interference, Elon Musk allowed this fleet to fire caliber missiles at Ukrainian cities. As a result, civilians, children are being killed. This is the price of a cocktail of ignorance and big ego. Listen, I, I, it's understandable. Well, Jill probably knows this better than I would assume anybody here, but like, you know, diplomats and people working in intelligence and people working in geopolitics, it's, it's, you have to be a highly trained person and you have to have incredible experience. Um, some schmo 
you know, who fashions himself as a modern day Iron Man that does not have, he may have all the money in the world, but he doesn't have the actual experience and the, the, he doesn't have the chops to, to, to get into that. Of course. But what do you do about it? He's got the, he owns the satellites. You, you privatize. I mean, you, um, uh, what is the opposite? So, of so this is not you the take first. Take them over? What? When it comes to satellites, this was not the first time this happened. There was a company that tried to launch CubeSats. So the Starlink network is, these are low earth orbit, um, networked uh, tiny little satellites that um, Amazon is also trying to launch. So they've got their own version of this called Kuiper that, that you know, we're talking about Are they even close to launching thousands. those? I've heard Bezos talking about they it. Were, um, so they were tracking pretty close together uh, and... You know, the government and and Amazon don't get along, as you know, like the contracts keep getting jettisoned yep. and there's all Jedi. kinds of problems. Yep. Um, right. So but there was a, a company that tried to launch and they didn't get clearance from the U.S. government. So they hopped on. They got payload access from an Indian um, vehicle that went up. You know, so like, what does it mean if the if your country says no, for whatever reason, we don't want these. <laughs> we don't want your satellites up there. And they they pay off another countries, you know, um, ship that's going up uh, where, where there's payload access. These are really complicated questions. And we just haven't, the, the challenge with policy and regulation is that they are inherently reactive, not proactive. So we just, we're in this moment in time where so much is unprecedented that we don't really have a way to think through how do we make these decisions? And in the absence of a decision, there's you become vulnerable and while everybody's waiting around some rich guy can come on in and you know send things up yeah you've said this before we don't think strategically um i mean obviously it would be nice if nasa had launched its own <laughs> satellites and provided connectivity to ukraine um <laughs> but that that horse sailed if horses could sail, would have sailed years ago. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's anything we can do about it now. And Elon often just flaunts, I mean, he's flaunted the F SEC. Um, he flaunted the FAA and launched uh, Starship. Now he, now he's on hold. He's got Starship stacked and made a big Starship, deal about that. Starship is going up again the next launch this week without people in it, right? Uh, no, because the FAA has is oh, still oh. holding it. But you know what? I don't think Elon cares, and I could easily see him launching without FAA approval. That's kind of my point, is Elon doesn't seem to care. One more story from that Isaacson book, and we'll talk more about it when it comes out and I have a chance to read it, but excerpts have been published. CNBC published an excerpt in which Isaacson uh, says Elon decided to change how full self-driving worked uh, late last year. Isaacson says... That, uh, full, that, that the autopilot on Tesla was rules-based. You know, you see a stoplight, you stop, you read the speed sign, you say what the speed limit is. Uh, but that Elon was convinced by the full self-driving team that they could do it with neural networks. They could train neural networks on the millions, tens of millions of videos from existing Teslas that they already have, and they could build a much better full self-driving. Isaacson says that was the full self-driving you saw Elon a couple of months ago when he took it out on the street and it ran, it almost ran into a car and he said, intervention and grabbed it. Uh, apparently, uh, they think it's doing a lot better. Plus, they have an advantage because no one else has those videos. We talked earlier today with Sam Abul Samet, who many of you know is our car expert. He's a researcher for uh, Guidehouse Insights. And uh, he says... Elon has always said that they were using neural networks for self for uh, the autopilot, that this isn't actually something new. But he says it is fraught with peril if you turn off the rules, because among other things, Isaacson talks about the fact, and Elon got in trouble with the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency because they were doing rolling stops. Because the neural network said 95% of drivers don't come to a full stop at a stop sign, so why should I? I'm trained on existing drivers, so we just slow down and roll through it. And, of course, Nitsa said, uh, yeah, there's a actual law here that you need to follow. Um, but, see, rules-based self-driving does know about laws. Neural network only knows about behavior. Um, again, Sam said this doesn't smell right. This is not what Elon has been saying all along. So he says either, either Elon's been lying 
or Isaacson misunderstood and got it wrong. So there, already in my mind, there are some real question marks about this biography that's coming in on Tuesday. You want to talk about AI for two seconds? And yeah, you wrote a book about it. I got it right here. Um, right. So you can think of AI... You can think of AI in many different ways, but there are two general rules of thought. One is rules-based AI systems, and the other is is learning in real time. What would it take to have a completely rules-based self-driving system? You would have to have an inconceivable amount of data. <laughs> there's a lot of rules. Right? Yeah. Um, and there's so, a lot of so edge that cases was, that you can't even write a rule for because you right. never saw that's this right. before. Yeah. So that was never entirely going to work, but it, it works in closed conditions where you can limit the variables. So if you're on a closed course and you can limit the variables, then that- Or maybe that the highway? Work. Yes and no. I mean, like stuff falls off of people's cars all the time. Yeah. I mean, I hit still rakes dealing all the time, with, yeah. Right, but, but what would it take to have a full neural network system? You would have to have compute that doesn't currently exist in our cars. Like the the types of data and the way that the car is connecting, well, that you, technology, as far as I know, doesn't. Couldn't exist you train yet. it? In fact, Elon says they're they're spending a lot of money on compute time to train, train it on the existing videos, and then some get some you know like like Chat GPT does or, or Stable Diffusion get a model, a smaller model that you mm -hmm. can put in the car. Couldn't you do it that way? Or no, that's fine. But how many? How how are the cars getting the models? Is my question. Oh well, all of our. You know what I mean? Like the. There are some pieces here that, unless it's some kind of over-the-air update where you're... It's I mean, a big update. It's a, the Stable Diffusion's models are 1.6 yeah. gigabytes. So so there are pieces here that don't make sense. And I'll just end with, you know, the same person who's telling everybody that neural net, the cars have always been doing this is the same guy that's like, neural link uh -huh. is here. <laughs> we have done it, which is complete bullshit. <laughs> Neuralink is Elon's plan to embed a uh, man-machine interface into your brain. And uh, didn't he get FDA approval to do it? I, I feel like... I don't know. And, and I, I just don't feel like it would be a good idea to volunteer for that. Um, I will also say, this is... Listen, this is... I, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to spend the whole night harping on this guy, but I'm just sick of it. Um, so Neuralink is also not some kind of brand new conceptual, interesting idea. There's a Brazilian researcher uh, whose name I'm going to butcher because while I've tried desperately to speak Portuguese, I can't make the <laughs> words come out of my mouth. It, it's Nicolai. Ugh, I'll, uh, anyhow, he was a Duke for a while. He, he's he's Brazilian. For years, he has been figuring out how to wire mammals to computers to make them. There, there's a wonderful series of um chimpanzees driving vehicles without any without using any parts of their bodies or just using thought why are we doing this the whole point is to help people who have suffered from stroke right. to regain um because and he's had some real success fine. with that right he has yeah but, so Miguel, again this is not Nicoleles. Miguel you. Angelo okay, Laporta my... Nicoleles. and I got and it his too, research sure. is much older and it's in, it's incredible but he's not going around like hey everybody you can think to the internet now i i crack the code <laughs> i'm just you know he's a promoter he is our pt barnum is that safe to say elon musk is our pt barnum i think that's fair never give a sucker an even break elon musk neuralink wins fda approval for human study of brain implants in may of this year i am not volunteering i like to, re I like to refer to him as car salesman elon musk <laughs> yeah well, he is a good car salesman. Uh, it says something, doesn't it? I bought a Tesla. Amy, you drive a Tesla. Bite your tongue, sir. I do not drive oh, a Tesla. I'm sorry. Never mind. I am one of the seven Americans <laughs> that bought an Audi Sportback. Oh, nice. E-tron. <laughs> E-tron, e baby. Uh, literally. I, I think that there are less than 20 of those cars in the United States. All right. It's very glitchy. Jill, are you driving a gas vehicle still? Or are you on a, have you gone... Uh, BMC bicycle. Oh, nice! Car. Very nice. We got no two car. cyclists here. Yeah. Taylor, what I'm did, not what? a I'm not a racer though. I'm a no. get around town, yeah. going to the library kind of rider. I love my e bike, but I'm too terrified to ride it in, in on the streets. Oh, it's not an e bike. It's, no, no, but it's I, pedal. Yeah, same thing. I just I won't ride a bicycle on the streets. I'm, I'm, I know I'll you got you got to get over that. Every, more people have to do it in order for That's it to true. get better. If we yeah. all did it. 
I'll say the innovation on the bike that I bought that I really like is it has a belt drive train instead of a chain. Oh, that's so cool. So there's no grease, there's no maintenance, it never falls off. And the guy at the bike shop was telling me that the very first bicycles had a belt drive train. I don't know why they got away from them, um, but it's clean and it's quiet and it just never needs any maintenance and it's great. What, yeah. what, what brand of bicycle is this? BMC. It's huh. a Swiss. It's a Swiss brand, yeah. and it's like this Uber commuter bicycle. So it's it's made to you be drive banged around. The Alpen Challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So not that. It's not that one, but okay. that's the company. But it's yeah. still kind of a chain. It's just a belt with with cogs on it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it smoother? Does it ride more ride more yeah, smoothly? Yeah. It's well. I mean, you know, it's a bicycle. Like it's <laughs> not over. That's the only problem. Let's it's all that pedaling. It here. All that but pedaling. It, it's just sort of like quiet and there's no, there's no greasing. There's no tightening. The yeah. chain will never fall off the chain. You'll never have to break it and shorten it. None of that stuff, um, which is just like the very most basic maintenance you can do on your bike, right? Is clean and grease your chain. But um, does it have a normal derailleur? No, this one has one of those internal hubs. Okay. So that's also like zero maintenance. Mm. This was the big selling point for me. It's not for you, Amy. And it's really nice fenders, like, built in. <laughs> I like fenders. <laughs> Taylor, how do you get around L.A.? You, you don't have a choice. You have to own a car to get around L.A. Yes, and I had a bike because I, I live on the east side where I can actually bike around a lot, and it just got stolen last week. Oh, so that I, sucks. I know. My, I, every bike leaves, I was thinking this recently, I've never had a bike not get stolen. Like, every time I've, a bike has left my life, it's been stolen, but... Um, but I have a really shitty car, yes, that I finally I got because I moved here thinking I don't need a car. I didn't have a car for three months. <laughs> and <laughs> well, I went to the used car. I went to the used car lot and I said, give me your cheapest car. I need to walk out of here today with a car. And I have a very <laughs> cheap car that gets me around. Um, so I, so it's not a 19, to the bicycle I'm going to guess talk. it's a 1986 Saturn. No? no? That would be pretty cheap. That would Should, be pretty right, bad. Rightly so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a decade old. But what, what were you saying, Jill, about the So bicycle? a little, a little B PSA for your listeners here. Yes. Um, I have, I'm going to bring you on a very short journey. But I had an incident today. Oh, no. I, lo I lost my bicycle key. Oh. So if you have a bicycle, take a picture of your bicycle key. It has a number on it. Mm. And that way, if you ever lose the key and you lose the backup, you can get a copy made um, I believe Kryptonite actually has a program where they will send you a free key if you have saved that number. It's not on the lock itself, it's only on the key. So I move around a lot, things get put into storage and travel around and lost, whatever. And I only had one bicycle key and it fell off my keychain. And I was like, God, it. I gotta break this bike lock. <sighs> so I went on a journey on YouTube and the internet to figure out the best way to bike break a U lock. And I successfully did it this morning, which was, <gasps> exciting but did you it, freeze so it did you freeze it to break it? I, you know what i did i don't think that really helped i think it oh. was really like i read some elon musk tweets and then i turned in the incredible hulk and i just brute forced wait a minute it. elon musk <laughs> tweeted how to break no. a kryptonite no okay. no 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 okay. wait, how, did, how did you so how what you, you do freeze it, though? you take some compressed oh, air oh. it, it didn't really work as it well as i had seen it on the videos but yeah. it, it worked a little bit and then you hit it with a hammer and you hope that nobody comes and asks you why you're breaking <laughs> somebody's bike. So, so here's the here's the tech angle. See, that's so the many many that's, years ago. By the way, the lesson learned is that not one person said, "What are you doing?" It was in a bike room. So oh, it was okay. a, it was a bike room in an apartment building oh, right. on a Sunday a morning. No, okay. no. But I did tell the the doorman. I was like, I told him when I lost the key, and I was like, I'm gonna break this bike lock. So you know, <laughs> when you see prepare yourself a shifty looking white lady in the bike <laughs> with room a, with a hammer, with a sledgehammer. <laughs> so here's the here's the tech twist to this. So in this journey of like, okay, now I got to replace my lock. I got to make sure I get a good one, blah, blah, blah. I had this memory from like early 2010s of all of my bicycle friends telling me, here's the deal with bicycle locks, how people break them. Um, you never want to have a chain lock because you can just chop them with bolt cutters and that's the easiest way. If you have the U-lock, that's better. It's not indefeatable, but nobody wants to carry around the tools to to break it so the u-lock is always the best because nobody wants to bother and i was like where did that article come from it was early 
wire cutter. <gasps> it was back in the day when, they when actually wire were cutter, wire before cutters. It was, <laughs> before it was New York Times, before it was bought by New York Times, and they would send people out to do these long, crazy investigative stories. So it was all, it's, it's, you know, the first line is like, you should buy the $49 kryptonite lock. And then it goes on to interview bicycle thieves in New York City oh to talk about the different ways that they break the locks, how they do it, why they use this method, not that one, how they scope them out. And the author is this guy who used to write for like Outdoor Magazine. I think he does some like outdoorsy stuff still. But he was like, I'm pretty sure I talked to the guy who stole my $5,000 <laughs> like a few years ago. Wow. Wire cutter just does not do con like stories like that anymore. Not anymore. No. Like Wire and cutter there, has has forked into a different a direction. Great piece in the Atlantic saying whatever happened to wire cutter a couple of weeks ago, and it was all about like what what is it that that took sort of this it's deep sad. nerdy investigative I'll tell you angle what it is. away? And New it, York it was Times. It, well, I think it was trying to monetize on it, right? Like reviews, right. which is the bread and butter of PC Mag. Having really good reviews is so worthwhile. You make so much money off those affiliate links. But if you want to be the best at it, you have to pay, pay people by the hour to do really deep stuff. Mm. And that is what early wire cutter was doing. And then New York Times wire cutter was like, let's try to cover everything and let's pay all of our freelancers a flat rate to do it, which is the norm in the industry. Um, but it's a different model. And yeah, lots of people have complained. It's like, oh, it's not as good as it used to be. Boy, I no, searched. I was just searching for what happened to the wire cutter and I found. There's a lot of people writing what happened to the wire cutter. It seems to be yeah. a, a common thread here. Uh, wow. I'm not even sure where to go to get reviews anymore. I, no. I kind of. PC Magazine. Because this PC very Magazine. trusty, trusted you, person, Jill Duffy. Jill, can you guys start covering bikes also? We, uh, we've we done a couple of e-bikes, but not that many. I feel like Tom's, Tom's Guide is yeah, still pretty yeah. good. How about um, Consumer Reports? Is that not. I mean, I trust them for then. dishwashers and garbage disposals, but are they good yeah, for but tech? Like, I mean, and, and by the way, I should mention so that Nicholas De Leon, who is their <laughs> their tech guy, is a regular on this show, and I love Nicholas. And the Stacey Higginbotham, who used to host this week in Google, is now an advocate at the Consumer Reports. So mm -hmm. we have some friends over there. I think I will tell you. I know. Lot, I know. They're a trustworthy, bunch of, right? They're trustworthy. I know a lot of people yeah. who've worked there. Really good people, and they all left because they didn't want to work in Yonkers anymore. Yeah, they have the beautiful facility. They, they mandated like in return to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who said, I, I, "Don't trust Consumer Reports. Those lab guys all wash their hair with soap." And uh, that's probably true. What? <laughs> that's such a random. <laughs> I know. Well, I would say, I think I was probably looking at shampoo reviews on Consumer Reports. So they wash their hair with soap. Don't read. Don't trust them. I always go on YouTube and TikTok because I like to see videos of whatever I'm going to buy. So Yeah, but, even and I know this from a book I read called Extremely Online. You can't well, trust those TikTok and YouTubers at all. No. Well, everyone's chilling spawn con, so I'll look on like a consumer reports or whatever, but I, then I want to watch the videos of the, the break. Wait, did you did you say chilling spawn con? Chilling. Chilling. Chilling, sp chilling I just I'm sorry, I just have to decompose deconstruct the shilling sponsored content. Yes. Which by the way, as you pointed out, when Heather Armstrong first did it was God, you're a terrible person. And then suddenly Everybody's making so much money. Then it was the thing to do. In fact, you even say people were faking that they had sponsorships because it was so prestigious. Yeah. And then, of course, the FTC started away in and saying, you can't, you got to tell people that's an ad. Do yes. they do hey, they now? The SponCon? SponCon. Can I ask a question about SponCon? Yeah. Um, so remember when the influencers slash investigative journalists, I love saying that, went to China for Xi'an? Is it Xi'an or Shine? I always say Xi'an, but Xi'an. Xi'an. Yeah. Yes. Um when they went on a on a paid tour and told everybody how amazing everything was, and then the universe was like, What the hell is wrong with you? Was there what happened after that? What was the coda to that story? Um, literally the main girl that got canceled the hardest deleted her video and cut her partnership. But all the other girls, I think, kept the partnership and were like, we don't care about what the haters say. Uh, and they were probably right. Do? It didn't hurt them, did it? No. No. Right. So what do you... 
do they, are they aware that they are not, in fact, investigative journalists? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, no, I think a lot of them are okay. not. Like, I think a lot of people on TikTok do. I think people, I mean, it drives me crazy because all the YouTube drama channels also call themselves investigative journalists and they don't have any understanding of ethics. Or- cool. This is like cool, cool, cool. when Dennis yeah. Rodman went to North Korea. And yeah. Came from yeah. The- I forgot about that. Great leader. Yeah. Good okay. Work. So we, good. We got that settled. Leo, back to you. <laughs> no, that was good. I enjoyed that. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to take a break and let you guys take over the show because <laughs> you're doing a much better job than I am. This is a powerhouse panel. I want to spend hours with them, but we've got Amy's got to get stretched, so we're gonna we're gonna move right <laughs> right along here. Uh, we've got a great panel. Amy Webb is here from uh, the the signals are talking, the big nine, and her latest is the Genesis machine, the bio, the synthetic bio revolution. Uh, and, uh, you know, the big nine was so uh, prescient, I imagine, that we're very close to what she describes in the Genesis machine as well. Love having you on. Thank you, Amy. Jill Duffy is here from PC Magazine. She is also an expert on remote work. Wrote a good book. What's the name of that book? Everything Guide to Remote Work, which she, interestingly enough, wrote remotely. Absolutely. In Guatemala and places like that. Yeah. And for somebody I've been trying to get on this show forever, uh, but first she had to shill extremely online. It's t- just kidding. It's Taylor <laughs> Lorenz. You remember her from, of course, The Atlantic and then The New York Times and uh, most recently at The Washington Post where she covers social and frankly translates it for us old men who don't understand a thing going on. And I appreciate it. I uh, You made me mad in the book, though. I was really mad that the the, the young black girl who created the phrase on fleek never got credit for it. Well, now she's gotten credit, but she never really shared in the profit. No, I mean, that's sort of the the hallmark. One of the main problems with the internet is that so many times the creators of these viral things never get to see the financial upside. Uh, and that was particularly egregious. Yeah, one. I'm talking about expropriation. Well, wait, who- she was 16 years old. She was a viner, right? Yeah. Um, so who did profit from on, was there like a, did somebody try to trademark on fleek or? Yeah. So basically, so her name was, was Kayla, but she went by the handles peaches. I think it was peaches Monroe. Um, but so all these like ad, all these companies were using it in their marketing. Including like, Denny's of all people. Yeah, Denny's used it. A bunch of people started using it, like brands, like it was very quickly co-opted by brands and those brands never compensated her in any way. And so she never, so, ladies and gentlemen, just to write the record, here is Peaches Monroe from 2014. Oh, it won't play for me. <laughs> She's on fleek. Oh, well, you Oh, you know why it won't play? Look at the little V in the upper right-hand corner. It's Vine. It can still play on the web. Just click the play button in the middle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're talking to your Come grandpa. Come on, Leo. Click the it's play like button. Gr- grandpa, what's the play button? That thing in the middle. Click it. It doesn't work. Oh, it, man. I'm probably, oh, it's probably- it's, I'm on Linux with Firefox. A vine does not like me, I can tell you right now. We're going to take a little break. Maybe I can get it working with ExpressVPN. Love this panel. We're going to have lots more to talk about in just a bit. Our sponsor is ExpressVPN, the VPN I use, the one I recommend. If you ever read the fine print, it, it isn't, it's fine, but it pops up right when you go into incognito mode, you know? It says... What do you think incognito mode means? Private, right? Nobody can see what I'm doing. No, it says your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. How can they even call it incognito? (laughs) It's really just so your spouse won't see what you're doing. But okay, to really stop people from seeing the sites you need, if you really, you visit, if you really want privacy from your ISP, your school, your employer, Google, you need a VPN. And when you use a VPN, you got to use one that doesn't track you, that doesn't log you, that keeps you private. Because everything you want to protect yourself from online, you're just kicking the can down the road to the VPN. Your your ISP doesn't see it, but whoever's at the other end of the VPN sees it. So you need to go with somebody you trust. That's why I recommend and use ExpressVPN, the number one trusted VPN. I'll tell you a couple of things ExpressVPN does to protect you. First of all, they created their own trusted server 
the server, when you press that big button on your ExpressVPN app, fires up in RAM, sandboxed. It can't write to the hard drive. And then when you close that server, which is only you, has only been yours, disappears from RAM and there's no trace of your presence. And But even more, they use a custom Debian installation that when you when it, every morning they reboot the servers, wipes the drive, starts from scratch. So you are really in incognito mode, but only when you're using ExpressVPN. You don't want your parents to see what you've been looking at, do you, kids? What's more, your home internet provider is often not only recording what you're doing, but selling it to marketers, to data brokers. They're legally allowed to in the U.S. That's why you really need ExpressVPN. It encrypts all your network traffic, which gives you security, but also gives you privacy, reroutes it through their secure servers. And as I just told you, their servers do not log your visits, so you are completely private. It works on all your devices. You can even buy a router that runs ExpressVPN. They sell some very good ones at the site. Or you can install it on, on certain makes. They tell you what makes you can install it on. You can run on your iOS, your Android, your Linux, Windows, your Mac. Everywhere you are, and it protects you with the push of a button. You tap it to connect. Your browsing activity is secure. That's incognito mode. So stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash twit. Expressvpn.com slash twit. You will get three extra months free with a one-year package. E-X-P-R-E-S-S, -S, expressvpn.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of this week in tech. Peaches Monroe. Have you have you been in touch with Peaches uh, in, uh, since or... I don't think I interviewed Kayla at this. I don't, I can't remember if I actually even talked to her at the time or not. I don't think I did. 53 um, million loops of this on Fleek video. It, minus one, because I, it doesn't, I can't. Play. I will say like that kicked off a big conversation about credit. Like she's definitely been sort of like vindicated by the internet by now. Yeah. But the point is, is like, this is sort of a hallmark of the internet is that a lot of people create these viral moments that are co-opted by brands and used for marketing. And a lot of times it's very hard for them to capture that. Now it's getting easier, obviously. Now, if, you know, it would be a different situation now. But I also write about Jalea Harmon, who created the Renegade Dance. And, you know, until I wrote my story in the New York Times, was, was never able to profit from it. It is the 20th anniversary of... This. Some people just don't want to be remembered. Oh my God! You remember this? Of course. Twenty yes. years. Twenty years ago. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that. What is that? You don't remember that? Well, wait. I was extremely offline-ish for a while because oh, I was. Oh, you're in I Japan. Overseas. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or China. What is that? That's all it is. That's what it is. There's nothing more to say. That's what it is. Cool. Happy 20th birthday. Is that like a peanut butter jelly time situation? Very similar. Or? Very much. Very yeah. similar. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm driving people crazy. I'm going to stop it now. I'm going to stop it. Stop it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I missed out on pop culture for like six straight years. Oh, I didn't and miss anything, I don't think. Yeah. Hey, good news. We have an FCC uh, commission. Uh, a sad story about Gigi Son, who President Biden had nominated, but was stalled by the Republican Congress for more than 18 months. Uh, she backed down. And uh, now uh, her replacement nomination has been passed through Congress. So we have a full FCC, which is probably a good thing. Uh, we, need a, we need a full FCC uh, running. Uh, we've got a great chairman. Uh, Jessica Rosen Morsel, and two days ago, the Senate uh, confirmed the fifth commissioner, Anna Gomez, uh, 54, 55 to 43. So Democrats have a majority. As often as the case, the president gets to nominate, and so the party of the president usually has a majority. Um, it has been split for two years. I hope we will see some uh, Im important and regulations from the FCC. Um, and speaking you of, you're, you're, you're hoping for something, I know. uh, an alternative to Ajit. Yeah. Well, Ajit Pai was a nightmare, right? And I think Jessica Rosenworcel is really good, but without a majority, uh, she's not going to be able to get as much done. So I think this is important. Um, her, I mean, somebody also equally important in the world of, uh, 
regulation. Marguerite Vestager is setting, stepping aside as uh, the uh, EU commissioner uh, pre- for uh, European Competition Commission. She wants to get a job as the president of a European investment bank. If she doesn't win the election, she'll come back. But she was very active in pursuing Google and Microsoft and, and Facebook and others. In fact, she may be part of the reason Meta is now considering allowing Instagram and Facebook users to pay in Europe. Don't get your hopes up. Um, because uh, the uh, EU is not thrilled about Meta's data collection practices, particularly. And this is interesting, I think. They don't like the fact that Meta and I presume others like Google use your personal information to determine what ads to show you. They think that's an invasion of privacy and that consumers should be able to turn that off. Of course, it is the entire business model for Facebook and Google. So uh, Facebook's alternative, according to the New York Times and three people with knowledge of the company's plans, will be to offer an ad-free version of Facebook in the EU that you pay for. Meta has not said. Do you Do you all have the opinion that the EU is the only entity with some teeth or maybe it's just gumming but like <laughs> kind of better than anything else we've seen maybe it's not what we want but like that the eu is at least trying to push for some regulation or reforms well so historically uh europe's co- sole contribute not sole europe's primary area of innovation is in policy and regulation so they were they've always been way ahead of everybody else in the world on privacy regulation um, they have comprehensive reforms on data. They just passed a brand yep. new a- set of um, sweeping set of AI regulations. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, who's the current uh, president of 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 the Commission, is another um, supporter of privacy and and not super fond of of big tech. Um, so I. You know, in the absence of the United States, we, we have whiplash here because depending on who's in office, you know, the pendulum swings drastically in either direction. And it's really challenging here because we have we don't even really have a federated um, alignment. Every, you know, California is totally different from Illinois, totally different from New York. Um, so you've got a single policy governing all of Europe. It's hard to enforce, but what they don't have is policy uncertainty. So that makes the business environment much more certain. And you know, I just we do it. We just opened up an office in Berlin, so we're I'm in Europe all the time, and it it does make things easier. You could argue that it hampers innovation, um, but so I, to me, this this thing with charging, you know, trying to get users to pay is a way of. Uh, is it skirting tri- some of the current policies? Is it, a, is it a trial balloon, much like Meta in Canada saying, "Okay, no news for you"? Is it kind of a th- a threat to the commission that, well, you want to, yeah, you want to make people pay for fa- their face? Facebook, by the way, is Europe is the second most lucrative region for Meta after North America. It's yeah. A, it's Don't a get big- me started on on the cutting off the news. Years ago, 15 years ago, I had the editors of of the top, editors and publishers of the top news organizations in the U.S. and U.K. in a room. And I said, listen, you're the partner. There is no partnership with Facebook. There, there is the, the business model does not work in your favor. So if you continue along this pathway where all of the content is free and, in, and you're going to erode your base, um, what's the plan? The better thing to do is to append the URL and prevent Facebook from publishing your content for free. Um, and if everybody agrees to do that for some amount of time, it will challenge Facebook to the point where they have to make they, they have to make you an actual partner. And they didn't do that. So I find it incredibly interesting that Facebook flipped um, and, and news organizations are suffering as a result. You, so Anyhow, do you support C-18? Did you think that was a good idea, the Online News Act? What, the one at... The Canadian which, law. Because, because basically Canada said, and this was at yeah. the behest of publishers. When Australia did it, it was literally at yeah. the behest of Rupert Murdoch. Look, if you're going to sh- put snippets from our publications in your search results, you damn well better pay us. Mm-hmm. To which, which passed, by the way. And Meta, rather than negotiate with publishers in Canada, said, fine, no news. 
Right. And it hasn't hurt them, by the way. They don't care. It hasn't hurt Meta. It has hurt the news publishers. It's hurt the news publishers a lot. Right. And, and Pascal so Saint-Ange in uh, Canada, who's uh, the cultural minister and apparently still responsible for this for some reason, said that when the fires hit uh, Yellow uh, Knife, that this this was a huge humanitarian problem because people couldn't get their news from Facebook, which I disagree with, obviously. Right. Um, but you, so you don't think this was a good idea on the part of the Canadian? I don't. Th I haven't seen any policy that's a good idea at the moment. <laughs> okay. Again, because the problem is it inherently looks backward, and we just don't have an instrument right. in Western democracies um, that is more pliable. There, there is a way to be flexible without compromising core beliefs, but that is just not the way that our politicians well, you, in the U.S. or in Europe are used to operating. Do Canada, you I guess. blame uh, online entities for the? collapse of print journalism in, in uh... no i blame uh, i i have publicly for the past 20 years blamed stubborn headed um publishers and editors who who have just refused to build long-term strategy for their organizations yeah. i i they I knew this was coming and they didn't do anything about it is what you're saying no they didn't know that it was coming oh. that's the point um <laughs> yeah, but listen, they should have remember, do any of you remember the earliest days of Twitter when listening to NPR, the anchors made fun constantly? Yeah. It's a twerk. It's a tweak. It's a, you know, they, they they had to read, they had to read things out loud and it was clear that they just didn't want to. You know, every other business evolves and there are two industries that are consistently, significantly far behind the evolution of everything. That's insurance and news. They're very, very challenging business environments to operate in, but but it's it's self-inflicted. You mean like uh, like this? Twitter before Insta before email, <laughs> all of that. Our anchors, Katie Couric, Brian Great. Gumbel, and Elizabeth Vargas had one question, and it was, "What is the internet?" The A and then the ring around. <laughs> this never gets old. See, that's what I said. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. I've never heard it. Oh, I've never heard it said. Of course, that, in, in their defense, this was 1994. I mean, this was quite a while ago. I, I don't defend that. By 1994, there were plenty, like... Oh, no, existed. I know. I know. We were talking on the radio. I was talking about the internet a lot. People wanted to know how to get on it and how to, how to use it. And yeah, no, people know what the internet was. Uh, so they just, uh, they weren't thinking. I mean, all right. They just, there was no... Listen, I, my business is doing long-range scenario planning. Right. We almost exclusively work with large corporations. They we work you. with some governments. Yeah. No, I, 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 this is why I left journalism because I was tired <laughs> of of watching poor decisions being made over and over and over again. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, Tuesday. The first monopoly trial of the modern internet begins. Google. Uh, the Justice Department is bringing Google uh, to court. A uh, judge in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia will begin considering arguments at trial uh, about whether Google has illegally abused its power over online search to throttle competition. The U.S. versus Google is the government's first monopoly trial of the modern Internet era. It reminds us of uh, U.S. versus Microsoft in the late 90s. Is this the kind of regulation that we sh we should be pursuing? I mean, is this what EU has done? Is this a good thing? I have see, I have very mixed feelings. You were saying, uh, you know, I mean, I feel like, on the one hand, thank goodness somebody is regulating the EU, but on the other hand, and I know the big the big tech companies aren't going to self regulate. That's a problem. But I always worry that government doesn't really know. Government is a blunt instrument and doesn't really, you know, what are you, are you going to break up Google? Is that the right way to do this? What's the solution? And I guess you can argue that what the DOJ did in 1998 was very, ended up being good. We wouldn't have probably Google if Microsoft been allowed to dominate the landscape uh, in 1998. Taylor, any thoughts? Is it time to go after Google or is this a bad idea? I think it's time to go after all these companies. Why not? Why not? Why not? 
Google's very powerful, right? I mean, if you're not listed on Google, you don't exist. If it's, I know. If it's extremelyonlinebook.com for some reason raised the ire of Google, if you said something bad about Larry Page, which you I might add did not, but let's say you did and they decided, oh, we're going to pull that one down, it takes it off the internet, even though it's still there and technically nobody can find it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have issues with Google results. My Google results are deranged and people send traffic to weird websites that constantly... You mean if people my... search for your name? Oh, yeah. 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 I don't trust Google. I actually wrote a story recently about Google's failings and how they really have lost so much share in the... You know, I think you're correct. Generally, that's been true, that if you don't exist on Google, you know, like Google has been the authority, but I think... I mean, I'm not the only one to write about this. Charlie Wurzel also wrote a good piece too, but I think that like Google's search functionality has been overrun with, like Google search has been overrun with so much spam and SEO spam and garbage that it's getting less and less reliable. And I would also submit that it is a self-inflicted wound, but you're right. Yeah. You know, my wife said, Lisa said yesterday, oh, my Google search results are terrible. And I don't mean searching for herself, just searching in general are terrible. And that's because the first half above the fold is all Google stuff. It's, it's I mean, it, So this case in particular, I just want to read like one little piece from this New York Times sure. article. So it says the case centers on whether Google illegally cemented its dominance and, qu and squash competition by paying Apple and other companies to make its internet search engine the default on iPhone as well as on other devices and platforms. To me, that's like too little too late on that one. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like your default search engine is Google. If you didn't tackle that 15 years ago, like that ship has sailed. That is, I don't know. That to me sounds like, how is that the center of this case? I, what's so much more interesting now, and, and this kind of goes back to the point about government is a slow machine and they can't That's right. react to things. They can only respond retroactively to things. You know, the, the big the big shakeup that's happening now is, is, is chat GPT and other AI chatbots that are changing the way that people may search and get the information that they want. I'm still very skeptical about it, but I see where it, it, and it will hurt media and publishers even more, right? So if you can scrape an answer and deliver to somebody, um, you know, the answer to whatever they were searching for, the answer to their question, you give it to them in the form that they already want so that they no longer have to open a web page and scan the content, read the content, do a control F and find the word that they want. You're now getting rid of that hurdle of going to the web page at all. So, and I think, I think there have been some publishers who are already working um, with organizations to, to cut off their content from being searched or to say, you have to compensate us because if people are not clicking through to the web pages, we need to be compensated for that because you're taking our information, right? Like you're not telling anybody, you're not telling anybody that this is coming from my website, my blog, whatever, my company's website. Um, you're just, spoon feeding it to them without yeah. telling them at least google kind of gives you a That's, link back but, but right Chat so GPT that i, I think you know that. if if we had a more reactive um legislation that that would be the issue that they should be looking at now whereas yeah. instead they're looking at uh, your your default search engine on when you open safari or your default search page when you open safari on iphone is google search like who that, cares about that, that may be true but we also the, the this, this is the other. Th so in Europe, there is sort of a let's wait and see what the policy looks like. Then we will develop to the policy. But that is not what historically happens in the U.S., which means that there is some onus on businesses as well. Um, the AP signed a ridiculously stupid agreement to license content to to open AI. The problem is once you release his, once you release your archive to assist to to to, to, a, to a model and that model is trained you only get to sell it once, right? So there's there's no way to take it back out. So how does this impact the company's ability to make money over the very long term? Like Part you, of, could you could license it going forward. You could right? license because it. But, if you're a media but, publisher, you're going to be releasing new content every okay, day. Okay, that's and, fine. And ideally, but once, you want it to be up to date, right? Right. But the this is different. Once the model has been trained, you, you can license new content, but this is about the archive. There's... You, so it's a it's a one and done situation. It's not like continue to to pay to to access the learning will have happened. So the question is, how does this like what is the AP's business model going forward, and how does it need to evolve? And the answer is nobody did that work. 
which was a a short, you know, it, it was yet another case of let's get a short term win because we've got a cash flow issue or we've got a pick your flavor of the month issue without simultaneously doing the long term planning. It is the same story over and over and over again outside of media. CPG brands are, are about to face a gigantic headache. Um, so CPG are, are packaged goods ranging from makeup to chips, things like that. So one of the plugins coming for ChatGPT, it's launched. I don't know if everybody has access to it, um, allows you to automatically add things to Instacart. So, you know, you look for a recipe, you look for whatever, you get a recommendation. Um, you can, you, you know, it'll give you the list and then just say, add it all to Instacart and it will do that. Um, but who's, so, so, so I've done that and there's no choice in which brand shows up where. So, there, there's something analogous here to, to SEO dying for media brands, as well as for, you know, choice suddenly being limited when it comes to the stuff we buy. Who decide? How is ChatGPT or any other system deciding which product from which you know brand is listed where? There's no transparency. So th this is kind of the thing. You know, there's a very different situation in in, for example, the UAE. So in Dubai and Abu Dhabi two big cities within the Emirates, but they kind of operate separately. Um, they actually beta test policy before they release it. So as technology is evolving, somebody is also trying to sort out, okay, well, what does our policy need to be regarding this? You know, it's a, it's a different way of operating. We're, if, if, if the best that we can do right now is trying to argue and solve the problem of Google being a default, you know, browser on a phone, you know, we are, it's it's a little late is what you're we're, saying it's a little it's, we're all a little late to this party you know is it i mean getting back to the google thing is it wrong for google to pay apple eight to twelve billion dollars a year so that they are the default search in safari on an iphone i mean you can change it it's not that they're saying you can't change it they just want to be the default because they know most people just use the default is that wrong i mean the doj says it is doesn't seem to me like a terrible thing to do. I mean, Microsoft could, <laughs> incidentally, according to the New York Times, it's 14 to 21% of Apple's annual profits is that money they get from Google. Which, which profit? The profit before the $200 billion uh, evaporation in the market? That <laughs> happened a couple of days ago because Chinese people are buying uh, That's non just stocks. Now? By the way, that's another interesting story, isn't it? The Chinese government has told uh, government officials they can no longer use iPhones reasonably. You know, we don't, we probably don't use Chinese phones in the Defense Department either, do we? Um, but, but that's such a big market. There's so many people who work in the Chinese government that, that tanked Apple's stock because Apple is getting a lot of its growth from China. I don't know what, I don't know what to say about that. Apple doesn't control that any more than Elon Musk controls the fact that half of Teslas are made in Shanghai. We're quite intertwined, our economies. There is a smoking gun in this uh, DOJ case, however. Uh, in 2018, Tim Cook and Sundar Pichai of Google met to discuss how they could increase revenue from search. This is according to the New York Times. After the meeting, a senior Apple employee wrote, oh, there's a mistake, put it in writing to a Google counterpart, quote, our vision is that we work as if we are one company. Whoops. <laughs> I think that is, that, is, that is collusion, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so they may have a smoking gun on this one. I don't think it's wrong, though. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure I understand why it would be wrong for Google or for Google to say to people who are using Android and they want the Googleized version of Android, well, okay, but you got to make Google the default search. I don't... Is that wrong? Isn't that just business? Well, we usually think in analogies, right? So what's... Is there another situation where... Uh, you've got a walled garden and another company would pay. Well, I'll put it this way. And when you go to a grocery store and you notice that Cap'n Crunch is on the end cap, that's because Cap'n Crunch paid to be the grocery store to be on the end cap. Right. It's kind of like that. Is that wrong? You know, I think that I think the challenge is uh, Captain Crunch is cereal and we're talking about information. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean... Now, if it had been Count Chocula, totally Okay, different story. Different, different story. <laughs> um, I, do, I feel like... Um, I mean, honestly, grocery stores, most of their revenue comes from those deals, not you know from product placement in the store. And that certainly affects how we buy. 
I mean, I, I, you know, it, it, part of me is going, wait, isn't there maybe a problem that the iPhone is the one and only dominant phone? In the oh, United maybe. States? Like, yeah. hey, hey, doesn't that sort of like make me think, what are we? I mean, well, it's, right. It's the default search engines on on iPhones and iPhone, you know, iPads, and iDevices like, huh. Sounds like some other big company has a pretty big uh, That's an interesting point. market share. And, and not like you can't buy Android phones. And I'm sorry, Android people, you do exist. There are lots of great Android phones. But it is. It's the it's like 86% or something in the United States. It's big. So, yeah, like why? I don't know. This, this being the center of the case just doesn't sound like it's the right angle. But isn't, There's so many other you're... problems with Google. Uh, and I mean, if you, if you want to think about what it's doing as a monopoly, like, the Google search piece, right? Like not the rest of Alphabet, but Google search. It's it's that everybody online is building their content to be read by that company's algorithm, right? So and I, I pull the curtain back here. We do this at PC Mag. We look at search engine optimization. Absolutely. We look at what keywords we're supposed sure, to be using. So we do look we. at the frequency yeah. that we're supposed to be yeah. using. Everybody does it. We don't do it for DuckDuckGo. We do it for Google because right. that's where everybody is searching. Right. So it's it's not just about it being installed on your phone and so you use it. It's that the whole ecosystem is now like praying to this one God. But he, well, the really the larger issue, and I don't know what the legal basis is or anything is that you have these handful of companies that are totally dominant so it's not just that apple is dominant with the iphone or that google's dominant search it's that they collude and now the dominance takes over the whole market and and i think i mean that's kind of what you wrote about with the big nine i think right um is is that the the real problem here and i don't know if you can unwind this with the doj or with the eu but the real problem is there are just a handful of companies that are so vast and have such a huge cultural impact that they that they dominate. And if they work together, then we really have a problem. And maybe that's what the DOJ is going after is this collusion between Apple and Google as opposed to just, you know, Google or just Apple. It is it is the fact that you've got two massive monopolies working together. That's really scary. I don't right. know how you unwind it. Well, I think there it's useful to think through context here we're a year and a half away from an election and the past couple of administrations have all gone after big tech unsuccessfully so it could just be at this point somebody is desperately trying to get a, a win um the lena FT khan at the ftc perhaps. i was just gonna say the ft lena has been incredibly unsuccessful um so that that might be some of what what's happening but to the point about consolidation it happens in every industry but it seems to happen at a slightly higher rate in the u.s than it does in other places i think as america like we're in america you're in the grocery store it feels like we have incredible abundance which we do but what we do not have is choice in this market um i just got back from japan where well, i was i just got back from everywhere because i've been all over the place but i was in japan a couple of weeks ago you know, and th there's all different types of mobile phone devices um, with all, you know, there's there's a lot there. There's much more to choose from than there is in the United States. Yeah. We're oftentimes when it comes to tech, choosing between an apple and a banana, you know, yep. literally an apple <laughs> right, and, and then something else. All right. I want to take a little break here. We've got a great panel. Taylor Lorenz is here from the Washington Post. Her new book, Extremely Online, is available for pre-order at extremelyonlinebook.com. And uh, it's so nice to have you on. I appreciate it, Taylor. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We're going to get Amy Webb out of here in about an hour and a half, a little less. Uh, she is at the Future Today Institute, the author of many great books, the latest, The Genesis Machine. And from PC Magazine, Jill Duffy, the author of The Everything Guide to Remote Work. I have your book here somewhere. I'll find it. i got to hold up everybody's books. Our show today brought to you by Duo. Duo, you probably know Duo. I hope you do. Duo protects against breaches with a leading access management suite. Uh, it is really important these days. You hear more and more stories all the time about access, bad guys getting into your network, getting through the perimeter, strong multi-layered defenses and innovative capabilities are designed to allow legitimate users in and keep bad actors out. That's how Duo works. For any organization concerned about being breached, 
that needs protection fast. Duo quickly enables strong security while also improving user productivity. Duo prevents unauthorized access with multi-layered defenses and modern capabilities to thwart sophisticated malicious access attempts. But here's the really cool thing. Duo can increase authentication requirements in real time when the risk goes up. But when the risk goes down, they make it easier to get in. Duo enables high productivity by only requiring authentication when needed, which means you've got swift, easy access, but it's fully secure. It is a strong all-in-one solution for MFA, for passwordless, single sign-on, trusted endpoint verification. You need to know the name Duo if you don't already. Duo helps you implement zero trust principles by verifying users and their devices. Start your free trial. Sign up today. The address, cs.co slash twit. That's cs.co slash twit. Secure user access without breaking the bank with Duo. We thank Duo for supporting us. We appreciate it. You know, I almost should stop talking about government action against big tech because there's just nothing to say. It's like, yeah, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, in fact, the FTC is going after Amazon now. Uh, I thought this was a funny story from the Wall Street Journal. Top members of Amazon legal team had a video call with FTC officials August 15th. They call these meetings the last rights meetings because it's the last step before we go to court, right? So you got the FTC lawyers, you got the Amazon lawyers, and the whole idea is now Amazon has a, a, a chance to make its case to head off a possible lawsuit. <laughs> Amazon's lawyers said, no, go ahead. <laughs> so us. Made no concessions. So the FTC says they are going to file a lawsuit against Amazon later this month. Uh, similar issues. They're examining whether Amazon favorites its own products over competitors on its platform, how it treats outside sellers, uh, the fulfillment by Amazon logistics program, pricing on Amazon.com by third-party sellers. Uh, the lawsuit will suggest Amazon makes structural remedies that could lead to a breakup of the company. We'll see if Lena Khan has, has a win or a loss on this one. I will defend Lena Khan, though, Amy. Uh, Cory Doctorow wrote a very, uh, I think, uh, convincing piece in his on his pluralistic blog saying they're all focused on the one loss column, but there's a lot of things the FTC has done and successfully done in her under her tenure that everybody would support, making it easier to cancel something that you signed up for, things like that. And so there are wins. Plus, you can't ignore the fact that there is a chilling effect. Even if you win these cases, you don't want to do, you don't want to go to court. And so there is a chilling effect. Uh, and a number of people have said, yeah, I've been in companies where they said, well, we can't really do that because we don't want to, we don't want to face the FTC. Even if they're going to lose, it's painful. So I will defend uh, the FTC and Lena Khan. All right, let's move on. Again, government, nobody, there's nothing to say. Well, there is a victory. The, uh, the UK is sort of back down on the Snoopers uh, charter, in particular the uh, part of the uh, um, uh, UK's, uh, what, what do they call this? The, uh, uh can't remember the name of the uh, UK. The real, it's called the really dumb uh, forest <laughs> surveillance bill. The one, the one that says, hey, you can have encryption, but if we ask for the clear text of that message, you damn well better provide it. Uh, they did not, I want to point out, they did not, this is the online safety bill. They did not take out the provisions that say you have to provide the clear text of the message. But they did say, but we won't enforce it. <laughs> so I don't know if it's a victory. Uh, you know, Wired says Britain admits defeat in controversial fight to break encryption, except a number of people pointed out to me they did not take that part of the law out. Uh, you remember that WhatsApp and Signal had threatened to pull out of the UK if the bill was passed. Signal said it's a victory. Um, but essentially what the UK said, well, we won't force them to send us clear text if there's no way to do that technologically. 
What, why is this even what this? I thought this was about child pornography. And what they were trying to do was get some kind of backdoor access or some type of access into seeing if somebody had shared photos. Right. Wasn't right. that the genesis of this whole thing? Right. So who, what does it matter what if you can see a text message letters you don't need ocr to, to detect i think this is a case of as the u.s government has also done using child pornography as a straw man sure sure because what they really do want is a, a way a backdoor to all encryption right, right and if they insist that yeah you have to have some sort of csam scanning technology even if a device is encrypted even if signal or whatsapp is encrypted they're essentially saying there has to be a backdoor csam is the paper tiger here it's like well nobody's in favor of child pornography you're right well we hate that it's terrible well then why wouldn't you let us see everything going on in your service right uh, i think the u.s tried to make the same argument just after san bernardino yeah um uh that case i think there was an argument that if there had been a backdoor if there had been backdoor access that they would have been able to prevent the right. uh, shooting that happened right uh anyway ofcom has said okay uh, they didn't take. They did not take the clause out. The controversial clause still is in the legislation. It's still likely to pass into law. But they did acknowledge that. Well, it's got to be when it's technically feasible. <laughs> I I am not convinced. Despite the fact, I think that probably WhatsApp and Signal, and and a lot of other companies, including Apple, would like to stay in the UK, and so they're declaring. Mission accomplished, even though. Yeah, we'll yeah but you're. This is kind of. Uh, if you start connecting some of these dots, we've we've like gone through tonight. We were talking about Starlink access. We were talking about Meta maybe cutting off news access or news publishers not having access or maybe having access. People having to pay in order to get access. Governments trying to get backdoor access to encrypted apps. I think the red thread here is. You know, sometime in the near future, there's probably going to be some more macro debate around, you know, pit pitting sort of platforms and tech against government for control of our attention and, and who gets access to what. Yeah, it's, but this is information. See, it is an interesting thread, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we're saying we got to regulate big tech. On the other hand, we're saying, but you better not regulate encryption. Yeah, there's an interesting tension here. I don't, this is why I don't. And it's different country by country. I'll tell you where there's there's no debate, and that's China. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> which, know who's in charge there, don't we? Which already has figured it all out. <laughs> do you, uh, I mean, you spend a lot of time in China. Do you do you favor the Chinese Actually, approach? I have been invited to not spend time in China. What? Uh, so I, yes. Are you persona uh, non grata? I am. I have been uninvited from <gasps> China. Uh, when so did that happen? Under, uh, when did that book come out? 2019? <laughs> the Fang book? Right. Yeah. Or you'd call it... G-Mafia. You know, G-Mafia yes. is what you call it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> they didn't like what you said about Alibaba or Tencent? Or they did Baidu? not like what I said about uh, the, the scenarios where China take like does some really horrible stuff to the to the planet that seems like maybe is happening. No, they, they didn't so like that. So how do they let you know about that? Did they send you uh, a note? <laughs> uh, they did not. I have some friends in high places in our... And our government that asked me, it recommended that I, I don't just, I, I've, I used to live there. I don't need to go back. It's fine. I already know yeah, what yeah. The, the great one was. If you applied for a visa, it would be turned down. Is that what the upshot of it is kind of? Probably, uh, I, no. I, Did they like, arrest no. you at the border? I mean, what, what are we talking about? arrest here? me. I mean, honestly, I'm like small, I'm like small potatoes, but just they why. They don't want to see you there. Yeah. Why invite any potential problems? Right. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you're smart. Um, now that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals says that the Border Patrol can seize any device without a warrant, I may not want to leave the country again every, again anyway. You saw that. This is, uh, the courts have not settled this law. But uh, the most recent ruling, the Fifth Circuit ruled uh, about a, uh, an attorney who, uh, by the way, had a global entry uh, pass who, when he tried to get back to the United States, I think it was in Mexico, they seized his phone. He said, there's client privileged material on there. They said, fine, we'll send it off to the lab. He wouldn't give him the passcode. They said, fine, we'll send it off to the lab. Three months later, 
forensics cracks the phone. Then they send it off to a filter team that takes the so-called client privileged information out. Then they send it back to the Border Patrol so they can examine it. And he gets his phone six months later. Sues, the Fifth Circuit said, no, you don't need a warrant for that. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, this goes back and forth because some courts have said, no, no, you can't just take somebody's phone. Even the Supreme Court has said, you know, there's limits on what you can do. But the Fifth Circuit said, when you're crossing the border, all bets are off. They don't even need probable cause, and they certainly don't need a warrant. So just a word of warning if you're crossing the border. <laughs> Amy, you probably don't want to bring your phone with you. <laughs> no, I don't. I just, I just bring my bike. No, yeah, no. yeah, they can search your bike, sure. Actually, my bike is full of electronics. Um, oh. There's a computer on the bike, and... Uh -oh. uh, yeah, I've got data all over the place on that thing. Yeah, I I think it's some... This is the case was Malik versus the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. I think at some point we're going to need... This circuit is, is uh, New Orleans, right? That's yeah. in the south? Yeah. Well, let, let me see. So maybe he was crossing into... The, where was There's it? A lot of interesting things happening in the southern part of the United yes. States. Weird, little weird lawsuits that are, again, like Trojan so horses. Three to nothing, three to nothing ruling. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, Fifth Circuit also found that the Biden White House and the CDC violated the First Amendment when they told Twitter and Facebook to take down those uh, those uh, COVID uh, denier posts. Three judge panel found that contacts with tech companies by officials from the White House, the Surgeon General's office, the CDC, and the FBI amounted to coercion and violated the First Amendment. Um, what was the? I don't. Would, would there have been a penalty if they would have said no? Well, okay, I'll read from the Washington Post. The judges detail multiple emails and statements from White House officials that they say show escalating threats and pressure on social media companies to address COVID misinformation. The judges say the officials, quote, were not shy in their requests. Is that a threat? I don't know. I'm Leo, it is illegal to be shy. <laughs> it's not, I'm not shy. Fine. Calling for posts to be removed ASAP and appearing, and this is really where they went a step over the line, persistent and angry. The judges detailed a particularly contentious period in July 2021, which reached a boiling point when President Biden accused Facebook of killing people. That's ironic. <laughs> <laughs> the government. I mean, I mean, also Facebook. I don't know. This whole thing is so silly to me. I also wrote a story that's not up yet. I think it's going up tomorrow. But like right now, um, Facebook is blocking searches for the word vaccine on Facebook threads, on, you know, Instagram threads in the middle of another. So it's their right to do that. Nobody's disputing that. Totally, They're a private totally. company, I'm right? Saying, like, it's just so ridiculous. Like, I just think both of these parties in this, like, I don't, I think the government and Facebook are neither one of their hands are clean. And for one to accuse the other person of assisting and killing people, I think they've both, <laughs> I just think it's... They're both, they both have problems. The judges um, said that the platforms did change their policies based on FBI briefings. But see, the FBI was briefing them not only about COVID misinformation, but about foreign election interference and misinformation. And at that point, Facebook said, oh, and they, and they changed their policies. Twitter said, oh, this was under Jack Dorsey and changed their policies. Um, it seems to me that, of course, you could cross the line. If the FBI says you take that down or else, that's different. But if the FBI is giving you inform informational briefings saying, look, we found these are these are 23 uh, Russian troll farm accounts that are posting deliberate misinformation. You, sh you, you might want to, I'm not going to tell you what to do, <laughs> but you might want to think about that. That would be reasonable, right? They're not allowed, by the way, now at all to talk to uh, social networks. Um, government institutions affected by the ruling include the Surgeon General's Office, the CDC, and the FBI um, may not speak to social networks. I don't know. 
I think information is important. I think the social networks probably were open to getting briefings like that. Do you, did you have any reporting, Taylor, on what was going on? To, I mean, we know the conservatives think that the, they were trying to suppress conservative voices. I don't, I don't know yeah. if that's what's really going on. I think they were earnestly trying to get vaccine misinformation taken down and to get COVID misinformation taken down. Yeah. I think that I think it was earnest. And I, I think it's great to have those lines of communication open, as you said, without threats. I just think like neither one of those parties is necessarily they both have their own interests at play. And, you know, we'll see. I, I don't know, you know. Kat's been covering more of the, you know, Kat, who I work with, covered, I think she wrote that story, the one you're talking yes. about. Um, I just think, I, I mean, to me, the misinformation stuff is just really complicated and messy, and Facebook has a terrible track record on it. And again, uh, with the threads moderation, it's just been such a mess where they're just like blocking terms wholesale, which is such a blunt form of moderation. I, I just. It's a, it's a challenge for them. I understand. I'm a little bit sympathetic. I mean, it's hard to moderate especially at that kind of scale. But we have all these like large, like I, I was talking, I can't remember his name, the, some guy from Berkeley who's a misinformation um, researcher, he's great. But, you know, he was making these points, like we have large language models, we have all these technological advancements. I think these companies just don't like to invest in those things ah. and they just want to not, they don't want controversial stuff on there. So they just sort of block everything. You know, there's no nuance. And I think they could be doing a lot more nuanced moderation, although I'm not a huge fan of moderation in general. I prefer community moderation more than top down, but. Uh, we have a, I run a Mastodon instance with about, what's about four or 5,000 people. It's, it's, you know, uh, part of our community. And I just, I just unilaterally, <laughs> I ban people if I don't like what they're saying. I just, I just kick them off. I want to keep it friendly and nice. I don't ban people for most things, but if they say something that, you know, is over the top, I just kick them off. And, I uh, think that works. It works. That's one thing I love about Mastodon and something I love about Discord is like the mods are empowered to just yeah. create their own little. Yeah. Or where are you these days? Are you, I mean, obviously you're not on Twitter. Or are I you? Only, yeah, I only, I don't use it for tech news anymore. I don't use it to like grow my brand. I only use it to keep, I'm really immunocompromised and I, it's like the only place to get sort of real time updates about COVID. So I, isn't that sad that there, there are, there are things that happen on Twitter that don't happen anywhere else and we yeah. still need it for, but actually, I, hate I hate to say it. Yeah. I was actually watching college football yesterday too. I was watching the CU Nebraska game and I was like, man, I want to talk about this with someone and like Twitter, I wish I it's the last place one. you can do that though. Yep. Are you yeah. a buff? Yes. Oh, I my family is a CU, CU buff. My parents met at university of Colorado. So oh. my, Very my exciting. son, my son is a buff. He, Why? uh, he studied broadcast journalism, uh, at CU Boulder graduated about five, six years ago. Now he's a TikTok influencer. So but that's the that's the best path you can have in media right now honestly <laughs> he would he would say you know oh i gotta take these news courses you know he would go out with a package and interview people on the street he said they're so old-fashioned in the way they edit and you know they're teaching him a b editing and stuff ah. and, and it's just you know you're learning the old way of doing it so that you can do the new way and now he's you know his real claim to fame is his editing uh where he's, wow. he's very good he's a tiktok chef he, it's interesting. I'm going to send him your book uh, because he, one of the stories in your book that's very clear is if you, you live by the platform, you die by the platform. And so I keep saying, you know, at some point, TikTok, who knows, Trump almost killed it. Maybe it'll go away. You need to kind of continue, you know, so he's built his following on Instagram. He had about two and a half million on TikTok. He's now built his following on Instagram. He's starting to do YouTube shorts. And I said, that's right. Diversify. Um, two and a half million. He's. He's thriving. You That's probably great. know who he is. I don't want to say his name because, you know, I, I don't like to no ride on his no I don't like cloud. to ride on his coattails or anything like that. What's he, what's the Nepo baby in media but now on Twitter? What is that called? <laughs> that he is not a Nepo baby because he doesn't use my name. He doesn't mm -hmm. use my last name. So he's done it all on his own, which I'm very proud of him. He is uh, salt underscore Hank. Uh, wow. And he does stuff like uh, like this. <laughs> oh wow, he's a good editor. Oh, he's a really good editor. Yeah. Wait, 
That's amazing. Where's he? Ba- like, where's he? Fi- that kitchen looks nice. I think that's his mom's kitchen. <laughs> Let me see. He has a. He, ha- he lives in L.A. He's in Venice, but he ends up coming up here to Petaluma uh, once a month because he likes how mom's kitchen looks on camera. He's got a pretty nice kitchen himself too. It does a lot. You know, it does all the things you're supposed to do. The collabs. He was uh, he was presenting at Outside Lands on. They have a food. Uh, uh, you know, stage where people cook and it, he was, they were going to cook the Shaq burger or whatever. Shaquille O'Neal has some burger and Shaq bailed like 15 minutes before he said, I got a toothache. <laughs> so Wait a minute. he's got his own seasoning line. Oh yeah. Salt Hank. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Mission accomplished. We can end the show now and everybody can go home. I just wanted to get Taylor Lorenz up on the salt Hank. <laughs> anyway, he's a buff. So that that's what made me think of that. What, he, what is a what is a buff? He's a CU Boulder Buffalo. Buffalo, University Buffalo, of Colorado, got it, got it. Okay. where the buffaloes, where the buffaloes. I was feeling left out because I didn't know what a buff was. I, well, I'm glad now. you asked because you probably were not the <laughs> probably the whole audience said, "What are they talking about?" Now, did you when you go to the Buffalo games, they uh, they run with a wild bull, buffalo, Ralphie, wild yes. buffalo, right? Of course, it's not a it's not a bull. It's a buffalo. What am I thinking? They run with him onto the field, and it's crazy. They're going like a hundred miles an hour, running onto the field with this thing. Yeah, this is how they start the game. <laughs> they run a buffalo, and it's wild. This is not a trained buffalo. No, they have to <laughs> rail him in. They have to keep up with him. I honestly feel like he's a little bit terrified i guess I, but he he does it every game so can you imagine how he feels he was just wandering around the plains eating some tumbleweed and all of a sudden they're making him run around a football field anyway i don't know where we got how we got off into that uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> but i could fix it, put some work some colorado propaganda into this show thank you Yes. Well, you mentioned Buffalo, Nebraska. I mean, see you, uh, see you, Nebraska. I thought, oh, no. Well, oh, yeah. Either she's I, I a would... she's either a corn husker or a buff. So uh, I'm glad we got that settled. What about NFTs? How are you all feeling about NFTs these days? You you bullish? Oh, I'm feeling bisonish. Are you feeling... Or what was buffaloish? <laughs> oh, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> Little cartoon buffaloes. You know, they've yep, done yep. they've done apes. Uh, they've done crypto punks. They've uh, done owls. Yeah, I'm uh, feeling buff about it. Buffs, <laughs> buffs. Yeah. Maybe we could even buff. go NFT cryptocurrency punk. too with a buff. Yep. Yep. Uh, NFTs not doing so well. Monthly trading for NFTs between January 2022 and a couple of months ago plummeted 81 percent. NFT sales figures dropped 61 percent. Floor prices for the board apes and the crypto punks, two year lows. What that means is a lot of people who bought these got thinking, scammed. I'm gonna make some money on my on my crypto punk thirty seven uh are sitting there upside down, aren't they? They got scammed. I don't I'm know shocked. They, yeah. <laughs> Insert eye roll. Like <laughs> they got scammed, and that sucks. And it sucks when people are taken advantage I of. I feel bad because it because that's scammed. the sad thing. We had we had a, a, a we had a contractor come in and fix a door at the house, and I asked him, "Are you in crypto?" He said, "Yeah, I bought it a little bit." It's like, dude, <laughs> no. <laughs> I tried to I tried to tell him, don't please. Do yourself. Crypto crypto is kind of a it's a sad, confusing story too because like. You have a whole lot of people in the United States who don't trust banks because banks have never been good to them. Banks I understand. Have yes. Not given them loans. They have not given them bank accounts. They have not allowed them to buy property. They, you know, people have been disenfranchised from the financial industry for generations. And so when a new form of money comes along that is sort of marketed on this belief that anybody can get into it. I mean, it's it's lotto, right? All you need is a dollar and a dream. All you need to do is get in and and hold on, right? Get in at the right time and hold on. Don't let go. Hold the line, whatever. But it's it's still taking advantage of the same people. And but I also understand that desire to say I'm not dealing with the yeah. national banks anymore. Sure. I'm not doing that because all they have done is keep my family and my gen my you know my generational 
family in poverty. Like you, it, 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 I understand why people went into it. I understand how people got scammed and I understand how it's so easy for everybody else to laugh at them and be like, sure. ha, 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 you got scammed, but it's, yeah, it, it's like really devastating. And, and I think, I think it's probably good that it's, not as hyped up in the media anymore. And that a lot of people who, a lot of the celebrities who endorsed um, crypto are paying some consequences for that now, but it's really sad. And like, I feel like that's the angle that's not talked about very much. Justin Bieber, Paris Hilton, Madonna, Chris Rock, all promoted NFTs. I know, you know so what? You're saying that I'm the dummy for listening to, to Paris Hilton. <laughs> For investment advice. Leo, you're making me feel very bad you about myself. You should never... Right no, Paris is... Great. What is? I learned from uh, Taylor that she makes a million dollars a night uh, as, a, uh, as a DJ. She's doing all right, Paris. I agree with you, though, Jill. You made a very good point because it's also true with uh, vaccines in the health industry. There are people who quite yeah. rightly, especially black people, don't trust the medical. Yeah. Uh, industry. There are people because of history. Because, because of, of history, things quite that because it, happened in history. Yes. Uh, there are people who don't trust the government. Uh, you know, who are working in the Rust Belt, who, you know, have just been let down by the economy. Unfortunately, those groups are are vulnerable because they don't trust the institutions. They're vulnerable to scammers, which is even worse. Who come along and say, "Oh, you can trust us. We'll take care of you." And then it's just a big grift. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah. I don't know what the answer is to that, but uh, it is sad. I think it's wrong. Um, anyway, I hope you didn't buy NFTs and I feel bad if you did. I have one NFT. Can I show it to you guys? Yeah. Um, How can you show us? Is it on your phone? I know you don't have a physical object. I can't figure out how to sell it, so it's the only one. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, OpenSea is not uh, is not open for business right now. Uh, what did you buy? Okay, it, hold on. It's so ugly. Please tell me you were the one who who bought the six hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar yacht. What was that <laughs> called? A super is it mega a digital yacht, or was it's it a, a real yacht? yacht? My NFT looks like the avatar for like a five, you know, nine-year-old's Xbox controller. Oh God, that's awful! It's like a triangle <laughs> with sneakers. What? 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 Was that a collection that you you bought that from? What? It was my friend's <laughs> NFT project. Oh well, if it's a, it's if, see that's different. And I know many artists who actually used NFTs, and it was a way of supporting the artist. I think that's people cute. who did that, to, like you, to support a friend, that's different. You didn't buy that triangle with sneakers because you thought you were going to make a million dollars on it down the road, did you? No, no. I don't think that it's going to be worth a million dollars. No. I just think it's so hilariously <laughs> bad. No, I hate it. I'm, I'm sad that you're trying to sell your friend's NFT, though. Oh, no, I'm holding. I'm holding. Good. I'm hold. Holding. Hold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I'm, was, I'm not. Was it the same thing? Remember when you could buy a Pixel? Or you could buy 10 pixels. Oh, yeah, that worked really on. well. The million pixel project. Remember that? Right. Wasn't there a return promised? No, it was an ad, no. right? Okay. The million dollar like, homepage. Remember that? And then people. Yeah, I guess the point that I was making is we, we, we keep. I feel like sometimes I'm in like Westworld season two. Yeah. No, Westworld season one. Season two got bad. We shouldn't <laughs> want. But the, the point being like we just we keep or we're like we're like playing. We're like in sieve or something but we just keep living out the same storylines over and over again well you did see like that the fire festival's coming back yeah yeah fire too thank goodness <laughs> that was actually you talk about that in uh, in your book extremely online uh taylor about people like the kardashians who was it was it was promoting the fire festival made a quarter of a million dollars to promote the fire festival a lot of influencers. Yeah, Haley Bieber, I think, promoted it. Um, the Kendall Jenner. Kylie, oh, Kendall Jenner. That's who it was. Yeah. Uh, Quarter of a million dollars. Well, I just would like to tell everybody about Fire Festival, too, because uh, it's coming, and Billy's going to uh, put it together, and we're very, very excited. Tickets are already selling out, says Billy McFarland. <laughs> so let me, can I ask a question? Yes. So maybe Jill and, and Taylor both. So- because because you guys are both in media still, so if if a 
traditional publication were to post, the fire festival's coming, it's awesome, everybody should go to this, and there's a disaster, there's some liability there, right? There's some I level think he of went to jail. Or is there not? No, he well, went to jail. Versus, I mean, like if an influencer, my, my question is, what's the difference in accountability for promoting something, whether it's a crypto or an NFT or a fire festival? Are, is is the accountability the same for a traditional media org and an influencer or is it different? I don't, I don't know. There is no real established. I mean, sometimes the FTC has gone after people for like misleading advertising, but it's almost never like, and I think that became a big question after Fire Festival was like, who's liable? And it's kind of the same thing that a lot of these crypto celebrities are saying now, which is like, well, I look, I just, I, I don't endorse every product that I'm just because I'm paid to do an advertising. I'm just paid talent. Like I'll do, you know, and yeah. so they've sort of avoided liability themselves for promoting it. But I, but it, I yeah. well, but if it had been the Post or PC Mag or something like would either have, would that, would what would that have been like, right? If it, I, I mean, I'm trying to imagine what kind of article would be be in that vein. The kind, the kinds of articles we run, we do news. Um, I mean, the closest thing would be like an op ed, but then it would be labeled as right, this, right, this person's right. opinion. Everything else we do is going to be here's a fact, here's the evidence supporting the fact. I mean, so it's not going to be the writer saying we think this is great and you should go. It's going to be, you know, maybe an argument to say, here are the reasons, here's the evidence we have for why we think it's great. Mm. But I, I, yeah, I, I feel like in the kind of publication that PC Mag is, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have an article like that. PC Mag pumping fire festival. Content. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I was just trying to think of something analogous, like a yeah. gaming computer or something, or in the post, maybe like, I, I don't know. I get the question I'm making it asking is, who, where does accountability lie, if at all? And if it doesn't we, lie, there's, there, a, there's like, a precedent. We, we get threatened with lawsuit plenty, but that's, really? that's, wow. yeah, yeah. that's when companies will come to us and they'll say, you made an assertion in your article that was factually wrong. And so, so typically you're it happens, protected. Right? Things, Editorials protected. Are We're pretty well protected. Yeah. yeah. So if something is wrong, I mean, the best case scenario is the company approaches us and say, Hey, you got this wrong. And we say, can you show me why it's wrong? Like we, we want to have that conversation that we're not just taking them on face value. If it's wrong, we'll fix it. If it, if we stand by what we said, then there might be a little bit of back and forth, but it very, very quickly leaves the editorial chain and goes to some other legal entity in our corporation that will handle that for us. But it does happen from time to time. I, I wouldn't say it happens regularly, but it does happen from time to time where companies will come to us and, the personalities behind the people who really push, like they're not understanding the relationship and how it's like them trying to bully us into having a certain opinion about their product is not going to end well for them. You know, like, did you that's ever not the way to do it. hear of a pimple cream called acne statin? No, no. In 1978, Pat Boone said, my daughter used acne statin and it cleared up her acne. FTC fined him and he agreed, by the way, to make refunds to customers because he endorsed this product. It was the first time in 1978, first time the government ever held a celebrity uh, responsible for an endorsement of a product. It's quite a famous case. The FTC said Pat Boone received 25 cents for every bottle sold. Uh, the company set up a $175,000 fund for restitution. And uh, Pat Boone uh, apologized. Um, so he, it was the issue that he didn't disclose that he was getting a kickback from the company? Or was well, it these were ads. or both? I mean, when you do an ad, do people not assume that you're getting paid for the ad? He did radio, TV, and print ads in 1977 for the mail order product. Were they declared as ads? Yeah, that's what I, I'm not really understanding if it's an I mean, an ad is an ad, right? But if, well, you're, just if recently, you're not saying it's an ad, like it's advertorial. No, no, that's not what they got in trouble for. Um, they said the pro, FTC says the product does not really keep skin free of blemishes. <laughs> duh. Um, and Pat Boone said, no, no, my daughter really did use it. He signed a consent order in which he promised not only to stop appearing in the ads, but to pay about 2.5 percent of any money that the FTC or the courts might eventually order the company to refund to consumers. 
He said through a lawyer, his daughters actually did use acne statin and he was dismayed, dismayed, I tell you, to learn that the product's efficacy had not been scientifically established as he believed, but they still held him responsible. So what's the deal with Matt? Uh, not Matt Damon. Who, which Matt is with the crypto? Oh, yeah. I think it is Matt Damon. Okay. Fortune favors the brave. <laughs> so what are they expecting? I mean, Jennifer Aniston endorses uh, collagen peptides, and they had some manufacturing defects. So there was some plastic in the powder. Admit it. You use goop. Come headlines. on. Admit it. What's that? Nothing. I'm just kidding. No, I actually, that is, that's one of the protein powders that I can tolerate. So I, I actually use that. But the headlines when it came out were um, Jennifer Aniston's, you know, fancy protein. Doesn't versus, do. You know what I mean? So it, it was, that was the story versus like. There's a recall because there's some plastic that got got into this. Damon's kind of thing. De defense was that he, you know, he has that water uh, charity that he was doing it for the water charity, and uh, so he did the Super Bowl commercial for uh, Crypto.com. And I think, yeah, I think there are people. There's like a suit against him and uh, the others who do those ads. Damon said he gave his whole salary to Water.org. Uh, and that Crypto.com gave a mil another million dollars to the nonprofit. So maybe they did some good. Um, so what's so wouldn't a tech influencer, I'm not going to say his name, but you know who I'm talking about, sh shouldn't, shouldn't very well-known tech people who get everybody excited about something like NFTs or, or a crypto be held to a higher standard than just like Larry David? Of Kirby well, enthusiasm, and, and by the way, who makes that joke I just, commercial. I just want to point out, Larry David in that commercial said, "Do not buy crypto." <laughs> I just want but to he's point cleared. that. He's <laughs> cleared. I have, I, you know, we talked about crypto when it came out as a technological, you know, blockchain is technologically interesting. It's, it's infrastructure as infrastructure. Yeah, yes, fine. Long, very long term infrastructure, which it should continue to be and looked I have, at. I have always said, don't buy NFTs and don't invest in crypto i've always said that by the way there's still people right now in our chat room saying leo you should get off of that they're great uh usually that's people who are holding upside down investments in crypto yeah. and nfts but okay uh, we're, we're outright gamblers or gamblers yeah. yeah if you like yeah. to gamble I, nothing wrong with that all right i need to take another break because we gotta gotta keep this moving along uh but i am so glad to have the three of you here what a fun show our show today brought to you by Nareva. Oh, I haven't talked about Nareva in a while. As people come back uh, to work, but some people are still remote, it becomes really important that you have good sound in your meeting room. Uh, Nareva does meeting room audio better than anyone. They have a history of wowing IT pros. I'll give you an example. Duquesne University. They've installed 100 Nareva devices one of their senior technologists recently said, I cannot say enough about how impressed I am. Audio has been my life's work for 30 years. I'm amazed at a, what an Areva mic and speaker bar will do. So let me explain what it is. It is as easy to install as a speaker bar. In fact, it kind of looks like that, but it's got microphones and patented technology that puts thousands of virtual microphones throughout your meeting room so that people can comfortably have meetings, but he be heard by everybody, including remote people on the conference call. Nareva has just made another leap forward to the introduction of this new Pro Series featuring the HDL310. That's for large rooms. And if you've got a really big huddle room, HDL410. For the first time, you can get Pro Audio performance and plug-and-play simplicity in the same system. Before the Nareva Pro Series, multi-component Pro AV systems were the only way to get pro audio performance in large and extra large rooms. And I'm sure you've all been in those big meeting rooms where they've got the ten hundred thousand dollar systems installed and you know with this microphones and and all of that. The problem is, of course, uh, it not only is expensive, it has to be tuned constantly and adjusted. It's a lot of work. Nareva does it all so easily, so simply, and IT pros love it. Just go get an online demo. It highlights the Nareva audio expert being heard clearly. He's, even at one point, he's under the table. Can you hear me now? He's behind a pillar. It's a, it's a remarkable and patented technology. The HDL 410 covers rooms up to 35 feet by 55 feet. And all it takes is two mics and speaker bars, which you can install yourself. I mean, they're easy. Imagine, I mean, an extra large meeting room or a lecture hall even, 
with two discrete wall-mounted devices. And, and, and you can hear him clear as a bell. By the way, you can even use them indivisibly. If you've got a divisible room and you've got two set up, you know, pull the curtain and you've got now two rooms going. The HDL 410 also features a unified coverage map, which processes mic pickup from both devices simultaneously. So it becomes like one giant single mic array. The 310, the, the baby brother, oh, it's only 30 feet by 30 feet. And that's just one mic and speaker bar. It ain't, it ain't no baby. It takes about 30 minutes to install. With the continuous auto calibration, Nareva Audio automatically and continuously adapts to changes in the room's acoustic profile. See, there it is right there. And with Nareva Console, which is a cloud-based device management platform, you can manage your rooms, even if you've got like Duquesne University, hundreds of them, you can manage them without leaving your desk right from the console. Bottom line, with the Pro Series, Nareva makes it simple to quickly and cost-effectively equip more of your spaces for remote collaboration. IT loves it, too. They get firmware updates. You can check the device status. You can change the, set it, change the settings all from your computer. Learn more at Nareva.com slash twit. N-U-R-E-V-A. Nareva.com slash T-W-I-T. When I got the demo at the website, I was blown away. You, you will see. It's amazing. Nareva.com slash twit. We thank him so much for uh, supporting this week in tech. Uh, who is who is Elon Musk not suing? He's he says he's going to sue the Jewish Defense League. What it's not it's the ADL. Is that the, the anti defamation anti defamation league. Yeah. league? Okay, it's not the JDL. All right. Uh, ironically, for defamation, he says that those ads that they said, which uh, they they did. I mean, we saw them. They said, "Don't buy ads on Twitter." You know, this guy's an anti-Semite. He says that was such a chill on their advertising that they cost him millions of dollars and he wants it back. Um, I'm sorry. So this was a dog whistle to get yes. a whole bunch of yes. super right wing. Did it work? Folks. Yeah. If you, I mean, I mean, did, well, depends on, you know. Uh, <sighs> if, if, if by working, you mean like was, riled up that entire Was that community. his intent? was to do that rather than actually sue you're saying or do you think he intends to I, sue my understanding is that he uh wants he, he will refuse to settle and that he will he wants things to go to trial hoping that somebody else will drop out right um whereas when others might settle jonathan greenblatt by the way is a very smart um he's he's a smart guy and he's picked a Musk has picked a formidable foe because Greenblatt's not backing down, and and he's going to run circles around Musk. I think is he the uh, CEO of uh, ADL? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can't wait to see it. To be honest, what's that? I can't wait to see it. To be honest, because I yeah, think told, that is a cage match. I would show up for. <laughs> yeah. Put the two of them in chairs and let them debate. <laughs> um. That that would be oh that, like it would be a KO within like a minute. And now X has filed a uh, lawsuit against California for AB 587, um, alleging that the California bill infringes on X's free speech rights because it forces companies to define uh, the terms it's using. Um, he says that it, it forces them to engage in speech against their will because they have to define racism and hate speech. X's complaint says it's difficult to reliably define hate speech, misinformation, political interference, and other content categories. And defining them is often fraught with political bias. I actually kind of agree with him on this one. This, to me, strikes me as another kind of ham-fisted attempt by uh, legislators to get social media companies to, you know, do their job, so to speak. Gavin Newsom says it's the it's a nation leading social media transparency measure. He signed into law last September. Can you legislate moderation? I don't think you should. I agree. I don't think you should. That's my personal opinion. I just think that um, it's so highly nuanced, and the modes of expression on each platform are so different. And I think it's not something that can come from the government. Yeah, or should. 
Uh, Mike Masnick, who uh, we trust on these subjects, says Elon Musk files really strong First Amendment challenge to California's terrible social media transparency law. I always agree with Mike on almost everything, yeah. I have to say. He's super smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always on the, he gets it. By the way, I made up my mind before I saw that headline. <laughs> so we're in agreement. 25 years old, Google is. 25. Uh, they just made up their birthday. So, you know, you could be any age you want when you make up your birthday. Uh, Sundar Pichai with uh, a message to uh, all Googlers. Questions, shrugs, and what comes next? A quarter century of change. Remember this? 1998, the Google homepage was so much simpler. It was a simpler time back then. Expect we're not going to do any more stories about this, but expect lots of them everywhere else. Are you going to do a story on Google's twenty fifth, Taylor? No, I just wrote a story about how Google's over. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. You know, twenty five years and out. I just meant in terms of how people find information, kind of back to what we're talking I, about. Yeah, I you know. Google isn't over in the sense that every time I try to use DuckDuckGo or Bing, I just go back to Google. But people go on Reddit, and I, yeah. I don't think that I don't think Google is the portal to the internet because we have such an app-based sort of online okay. experience now. I yeah. don't think you need to yeah. search. A court has ruled that YouTube is not under any obligation to carry Dr. Mercola's anti-vaccine videos. Joseph Mercola yesterday lost a lawsuit. He was trying to force YouTube to provide access to videos that were removed after YouTube banned his channels. He is a prominent uh, anti-vaccine uh, guy. Mercola said, you owe me $75,000 in damages for breaching your user contract and denying me access to my videos. The judge said, YouTube is under no obligation to host your content. <laughs> <laughs> the court found no breach, she wrote, because, quote, there is no provision on the terms of service that requires YouTube to maintain particular content or be a storage site for users' content. It, you know, if there's a threat here, it's confusing. That's the threat. I don't know what. Well, you know what would be interesting? The way that Florida is going with all of its various interpretations of laws. Um it would be interesting if Florida, it'd be interesting if state by, I mean, we, we have a little bit of this now, but it'd be, it'd be interesting if like different content is shown in different states based on different laws, because it's already kind of started to happen a little bit. I um, guess the we way could do that, Florida, right? Technologically. I mean, can you imagine right? like, I want to watch anti, I'm geofenced out of watching uh, <laughs> Uh, my anti-vax content unless I cross the border into Florida where I get all I, you know, all well, I can mainline it. You know, Didn't that happen with um, Pornhub? Porn porn, porn 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 yeah. yeah. But, but that was kind of, yeah. But that was hard. That would have been hard to implement fully. So they just shut it down. I'm talking right. about, yeah, yeah. This would be different. This would be YouTube saying, no, no, we'll, we'll take your content. Um, but we can only show it once you cross state lines. I mean, I could see that happening. In the, they already do it that way overseas. So, yeah. That would be so interesting and have such big effects on the creator world. Well, we it's, talk about really would. we talk about the splinter net, the idea of having different internets in different jurisdictions. I mean, I guess that's where we're headed, right? Well, well I mean, fascinating yeah. to me is when GDPR came out. You know, this is this speaks to the power of how much money companies are making by tracking you online and knowing everything that you do. Um, you know, you could have you could have seen companies say, well, we're going to make GDPR sort of like least common denominator. We're, we're just going to change our policies so that this is what we do everywhere. But instead, they said we're going to build these complex back end systems that make sure that we follow the rules of GDPR only in the EU and everywhere else. We're not going to do that. And to have that kind of money to build that and test it and roll it out on a reasonably short timeline too, that really says to me, they can't afford to lose or they don't want to lose any of the money that they're making anywhere else by not following those rules. But it, 
right? Like, cause, cause that's what, that's what we sort of assume is like, well, Cal- California will lead the way in the United States and then they'll pass laws. And then all the companies will say, well, we'll just do, we'll just follow California's rules and like roll it out the same everywhere. Cause that's cheaper and easier to do. They're saying um, that that's what the right to repair legislation in California will do. That it'll change it for the whole country because we can't have, but that's a little different. That's a physical process. I mean, the internet, you probably could geofence the internet. Right. It's still expensive, though. Yeah. Like it's not it's not a cheap solution. Well, you just look at somebody's IP address, match it up to a database of where they are and say, well, sorry, you're in Florida. You can't see this. Sorry, you're in California. Well, so this is right. So this is the difference is are you going to just cut them off wholesale or are you going to have a very complicated, you know, rule set for what they can and cannot see? So Would you cut them off wholesale, what, that's fine. What if PC right? Magazine, I mean, this is high, highly hypothetical, but what if for some reason some of your articles were legal in California and some weren't? You would just show the ones that were legal and have, a, I don't know, a blank, blank hole where the illegal ones are? You could you I mean, tell everybody to use a VPN. Yeah. I mean, I think technically it wouldn't, it wouldn't be impossible to implement, but... It seems like it would be undesirable. On the it other hand, it would be undesirable. I, I still think it would be very expensive because ideally, you would you would want to make sure that you're following the law as precisely as you can and getting through as much content as you right, can, right? Right. So, so I I think it would not be so simple as saying yes, no, yes, no. What's going to happen to TikTok, Taylor? Are, are they? <laughs> there's a there's a company that's in the meat grinder about with government one way or the other. Donald Trump yeah. tried to shut them down. They're using Oracle servers now. They've got a U.S. CEO, but they're still a Chinese-owned company. Like a lot of apps, are, they're you know, it's not even remotely the only Chinese-owned app. And there's so much entanglement between, you know, Chinese interests in American business. It just seems absolutely ridiculous to... Yeah target TikTok is instead of some sort of comprehensive data privacy reform. Yes. Which you don't have, Thank like, you. Yes. Yeah. Just stop selling to the data brokers, put the data brokers out of business because frankly, you shut down TikTok. China just goes to the data brokers and gets the same information exactly. from them. They don't need TikTok for that stuff. But it's just Facebook lobbying. I mean, so much, so much of this like anti TikTok stuff is just, it's Facebook and Google lobbying. So I never got an answer. I want to know from all three of you, what social networks are are going to survive? What ones are you using? There's not, I think we agreed there's not going to be anything that can replace Twitter, right? There's not, never going to be another Twitter. Or is there? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be a one-to-one -one replacement. I wrote um, actually recently, a couple months ago, about how tw uh, TikTok had already sort of cleaved off a lot of the core functions of Twitter, especially keeping up with news. Um, I think uh, although TikTok is not real time news, like the war in Ukraine or, you know, the Maui fires or like all these big news events, like people go to TikTok because you see real time footage of people. It's sort of the place that you go for news and information and pop culture news. My That's daughter convinced me that she's 31 and I and she, she said, I said, I've been reading that people use TikTok instead of Google for search. That's not that makes no sense. She said, yeah, it works. Try it. I said, all right, I want to know how long the Golden Gate Bridge is. She said, search on TikTok. I found a TikTok that said how long the Golden Gate Bridge is. This is part of, I put that, I put exactly <laughs> related to this in my article about how Google searches is. You can actually like, search. You can get everything from TikTok. Yeah. And, um, and other platforms. What about YouTube Threads? Also. What about Blue Sky? What about T2? What about Mastodon? Is anybody actually on Blue Sky? Didn't uh, it like not happen? Blue Ski. Blue ski. I'm not, it's I'm. There's somebody. Do you do you like do you even up. skeet? <laughs> you were I think, you were on Blue Sky a lot. I think it, originally Taylor, weren't you? Or were you? I was, still am. You still are. Yeah. I'm a post. I post like everywhere except Twitter for news. I totally stop it. But like, I think Blue Sky is for me. I find it useful as a journalist still for sourcing. There's like ten people on it, and it's decreasing every day. It's oh. basically like. Posters and oh. Mastodon. I mean, I I'm a Mastodon defender. I, I I mean, I know it doesn't probably never going to be a never mainstream social platform, but I do find it useful for a certain conversation. I like the community on it because it's pretty geeky. Yeah, 
That's probably why we're all, we all use it. I don't know that yeah. normal people want to use it. I don't want normal people do ever, to be honest with you. I'm not an expert. Yeah. Uh, threads for a while was like the thing. It went crazy because it was so easy to go over from Instagram. And now I keep seeing stories that the threads, people are disappearing and it's is it getting quiet? Oh, that, that's an example of you couldn't post really what you, I mean, they really restricted what content. Could oh, get really? Posted. Oh, did you that's run like up against barriers? Huge content moderation problem. Oh. This is, I, I, I said this the minute it launched. If, if journalists used Instagram more, they would realize how incredibly restrictive the, the content policies on there. And I get why I'm not totally against it, but like, it's a very restrictive platform. Oh. And well, it's they, meta. Of course it is. Yeah, but like if, if they want to have this real time social network again, they cannot just b wholesale ban the word vaccine like that is what that is the type of blunt moderation right. that they have. It's really hard to talk about newsworthy issues. Interesting. And T2 does not do that. But I haven't used T2 in a while. T2. But. <laughs> Blue Sky. How does it? <laughs> Can you post anything you want on Blue Sky? Yeah. How actively moderated is that? They got in trouble for actually for a while for for being a little f too friendly to uh, bad people. They were letting people put slurs in their usernames. Yeah. yeah. That's that's fixed though, right? That's fixed. I think there's I think this has all been an attempt to recreate Twitter and it's and A there's too many people doing it. And B, maybe we don't need another Twitter. Are we, could we, have we moved on? I'm, I'm a Twitter OG. I was on the platform just after it launched um, at South by and I, it, it's left a hole. I mean, it, yeah. it, the whole thing started tanking when during the um, 2016 election. So it, I think it really hasn't been the same since then, but you know, it was, uh, I, I, I had all of these lists set up and um, damn, what was Nuzzle? I had them all connected Nuzzle, to Nuzzle. Jonathan Abrams. A, Jonathan Abrams, who's always act. slightly, a little bit too early on just about everything, but it was a wonderful little app. It would scrape and deliver me news content. I mean, it was terrific. Um, plus all my friends were there. You know, Jonathan, it hasn't been the same since. Yeah. I haven't been on, I don't use Facebook and haven't for a long time. I'll tell you, I'm, I have one tiny Keybase group. Um, you still got out. the Keybase going. Good for yep. you. Yep. And then, like, a lot of my uh, people that I know have switched over to texting. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's the new social network, SMS. Texting is the new. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, a lot of texting now. I've How been dragged into WhatsApp. Yeah. How but, interesting. Uh, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm, all the stuff that used to be sort of public, we're all talking and discovering together has completely gone private. So all my social groups and social network interactions are totally private now. That's what's, what's really going on is you're using yeah. these. And I see people doing that with Discord. Aunt Pruitt's yeah. got a Slack for his whole family. I see people doing that as well. Um, yeah. And that's private. So you don't have to worry. But you don't know. No, I still worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have, must have weird friends. Yeah. But. But you, but you do lose that idea, that feeling that you are, you've got your thumb on the pulse, that you're tuned into Some the of that zeitgeist. that serendipity is gone, right? Yeah. The serendipity and the discoverability is is kind of gone, yeah. um, which I, I do miss. Now, see, fortunately, because I just checked Twitter, I know that Elon Musk has confirmed he has a third child with Grimes named Techno Mechanicus. Oh, oh good. good. <laughs> see, if it weren't for Twitter, I would never know that. I saw it on Tech Meme, I think. Oh, okay. There you go. Techno Mechanicus. Are they going to do a gender reveal with a rocket launch? <laughs> you know what? I, 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 uh, maybe the I'm describing... Plumes of yellow or pink <laughs> smoke filling the, the sky beneath the rocket. <laughs> you know, if you own a rocket ship, why not? God. Just, oh, I, I can think of reasons. <laughs> FAA may not like it. Um... I think I'm going to give Elon some credit, Elon and Grimes some credit. What they realize is that nobody wants their name to be dictated for them by their parents. So they give them a stupid ass name so that the kid, when they're old enough to realize their name, Techno Mechanicus, will name themselves, will come up with something, just call me TM, and then they will own their own name. And that's what, that's really what they're doing. They're saying there's no good name a parent can give a child. How about that? Okay. 
How about or, that? Don't defend it. Don't defend it. <laughs> when you named your child after a Jordanian landmark, did you think that they would be continue to be using that name into their adulthood? Yes. Actually, and, it's a great name, uh, I might add. In my circumstance, so my mom had died just before my daughter was born. Oh. And in our tradition, you usually name the right. Right. you name the child that's born after the person. So there was right. a lot of pressure on me to name my daughter after my mom. My mom died a terrible death. She was very, very oh, sick. And sorry. I just didn't want that reminder all the time. So sure. that's the, so we went with the other name. And it's a good name. It's very common in Europe. Is it? Know. So it is a great yeah. name. And it could be whatever you want it to be. So that's nice too. It doesn't have sure. a specific gender or or anything. It's just it's it's a good name. It's I don't just, have a listen. I don't have a I don't have a problem as much with the name as I do the sort of spreading the seed situation, uh, which again seems to be happening a lot among a certain set. Um, you mean like Elon of, having uh, how many kids? We don't even know. We've lost track. Is that what you're 11. talking about? Eleven now, I guess. Eleven. Yeah, but he's he's not the only one. There's a there's a you know there's a lot of um, men who wind up with a certain level of success. And and by the way, this is not a modern day thing. This goes back pretty far. If you look at extremely, extremely, a lot of extremely successful businessmen at some, and sadly, uh, those in my own field, uh, Foresight, um, those early, very successful futurists, including H.G. Wells, uh, wind up tiptoeing or rushing full on uh, into eugenics oh, um, and believing. That's not good. Yeah, yeah. So there is there is quite. Well, a that's bit kind of, of what that. Elon's saying is we smart people ought to have more children. Yeah, it's the effective altruism stuff is like the yeah. the movement of the moment. This is, is um, what uh, Jeff Jarvis calls Tescreal. Have you heard that acronym? <laughs> T -E -S. As in testicle? <laughs> yeah, oh. Sounds like it. It's short for, get this, transhumanism, extropianism, singulitarianism, commas, cosmism, cosmism, rationalism, effective altruism, and long-termism. I uh, think it's narcissism. Narcissism. Yeah, think, there you Taylor's go. Got the, the better. Uh, yes. Who needs an acronym? It's N. Yeah. All right. I want to take a little break, final break, and uh, and then I, we're going to say goodbye to a couple people, not you guys, uh, and uh, and wrap this up. Uh, our show today brought to you by our friends at ACI Learning. You probably see the signage around the studio. Uh, they've been a great support this year to us. In today's IT talent shortage, whether you operate as your own department or a part of a larger team, you got to keep those skills up to date. In fact, in a survey of uh, CIOs and CISOs, 94% agreed that the number one job is attracting and retaining talent. Now, that's good news for you if you want to be in IT. Get that job. K keep that job. Get a better job. Get promoted with IT learning from ACI. Uh, On-demand content is always up to date because ACI learning is consistently adding New videos to help keep you at the top of the game. They've got those studios in Gainesville. Beautiful place. Seven studios running Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Because the questions change, the tests change, the technology changes. There's new versions. So they always need new material. But all of their content is great. It's engaging. It's both informative and entertaining. That's probably why CI Learning's completion rate is 50% higher than their competitors. Plus, they've got these great tools like Cyber skills. It's a solution to future proof your entire organization, just, not just the IT department. Sure, there's IT training for the IT department, but what you really need is a cybersecurity training tool for all members of your organization. Cybersecurity awareness training. With cyber skills, you get flexible on demand training covering everything from password security, a phishing scams, what they are, how to avoid them, how to recognize them, malware prevention, network safety. And it's great training. Your employee is so much better than some of the training I've seen, i got to tell you. Your employees will stay motivated and engaged throughout the entire learning process. The material is informative, it's fun, and it's easy to follow. And with a simple one-hour course overview, your employees gain attack-specific training and knowledge check assessments based on common cyber threats that they're going to see on a daily basis. It's just a fact of life these days. They also get access to bonus courses, documentary-style episodes, they can learn about cyber attacks and breaches in their own way, in their own style, but they do learn, and that's the key. That protects you, and that protects your business. ACI Learning helps you invest in your team, entrust them to thrive, 
and increase the entire security of your business. So boost your enterprise cybersecurity confidence today with ACI Learning. Be bold. Train smart. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. You'll get at least 20% off just because you're listening. And discounts are as high as 65% off on an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. Discounts based on the size of your team. Just fill out the form and you're going to get a quote tailored to your needs. But do go to the website. Find out more. Great individual training as well. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. We've known these guys forever. And we love them. And you will love them too. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. We had a fun week this week on This Week in Tech. I've got the deets right here. Hey, our uh, intrepid staff have apparently for the first time ever watched the show. And they're, <laughs> they're wondering. Bert came in and said, that thing over Steve's left shoulder... That white thing, is that new? Well, I actually did the research. I said it appeared between episodes 568 and 569 back in July of 2016. What is that thing? That is a field test device for old school mainframe hard drives. Wow. Previously on Twit. Security Now. This week, we have our first sneak peek at Valid Drive which is the freeware I decided to quickly create to allow any Windows user to check any of their USB connected drives. Some of the people who have been testing it said that they think it's going to be GRC's number one most downloaded freeware. Hands on Windows. This week, we're gonna take our first look at ClipChamp, the video editor. I think it's the best app that Microsoft uh, includes for free with Windows 11. Club Twit exclusive. Today is the day that, man, many of you fine members have been waiting on is our fireside chat with two prolific sci-fi authors, starting up with Mr. Daniel Suarez and hey. Mr. Hey. Hugh Howie. It's really when you start to engage with readers you don't know, strangers, that it starts to become much more real. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get totally honest feedback, and you're also going to have that reader writer relationship which you'll never have let's say with your family because they obviously know you they've always known you it's yeah. like oh you're a writer now when you tell them you wrote a book they're all very skeptical twit <laughs> like you're cosplaying it's like oh exactly. <laughs> yeah a lot of fun that interview john scalzi joins us uh, next month uh, in our club if you're not a club member twit.tv slash club twit there's a lot of exclusive content you get ad-free versions of all of our shows and you get aunt pruitt and who wouldn't pay seven dollars a month just for Ant alone. Of course, access to our great Discord too. Twit.tv slash club twit. Jill, I thought at first this was you. I tried it working aboard an Amtrak train, but no. It That's my friend Kim <laughs> Key. She wrote a great piece. And I got to say the Washington Post also promoted her piece and wrote a, a couple of stories uh, related to it. Nice. I thought it was really fun because like I'm I'm slowly becoming a transit nerd where I care very much about like the development of trains and having infrastructure for people to get around easily. And, you know, it's it's frustrating when you start to really dig into it, like how far behind the U.S. is nothing, nothing new here. I'm just like getting more into it lately. So Kim is a colleague of mine. She lives in Georgia and she she took the overnight Amtrak train from Atlanta to New York City. She took the midnight train to from see. Georgia. <laughs> that midnight train from Georgia. <laughs> um, and she so she decided to write all about could you work on the train? And I haven't I haven't taken Amtrak train in a couple of years, but I definitely remember having frustrating experience with the Wi-Fi. And this is on like the Northeast Corridor where you have lots of people yeah, the commuting. The Acela and, line. Yeah, the Acela, yeah. the, First of all, let me tell you, the Acela, it's only like 40 minutes faster. Than I know. Actually, you know why? I, the tracks are in such crap condition that it goes really yeah. fast and then it goes really slow. You so ride the Acela? I'm on the Acela and I have been for 15 years, twice a week. So it, oh, it is gosh. my commute. I, um, Do you love it or no? No. Um, but it's a necessary <laughs> evil. Yeah. The reason it slows down is actually because there are parts of the track that it doesn't own. Right. So th there's a different company that has the right oh, of way. It's so terrible. it's and cockamamie and stupid. Clickety, clickety, clackety. Right. Yeah. Um, technically, you can work. There are tables if you get into the Acela in the right spot. Um, and I really wish people wouldn't because I've overheard conversations. <laughs> um, I heard the HR director of a major bank. I was sitting at a table with him and his colleague um, 
talking about a woman who had an executive who had just taken maternity leave. They were incensed that she would take three weeks off. And we're talking about how she could never possibly catch up when she gets back. Don't you hate it when women uh, blame, like use pregnancy as a way to get a free vacation? This is the head of HR. How do I know that? It was one of the cool things you can do on Amtrak. Well, you could at the time. They used to print everybody's names on the tickets. So when I would get in a car, I would walk up and down the aisle, memorize everybody's names, go look up everybody in private mode on LinkedIn. And then I would know everybody and all the they were saying about their colleagues and coworkers and everybody else. Oh yeah. I was so, and I'm like, dude, I'm literally sitting next to you. You, do you think I'm not hearing this conversation See, and I, how illegal everything that you're talking so about? In, I so in the case, I in the case of Kim, she, what she did was she got a private car. So she was in a sleeper car and she had some right, privacy. Well, I do love it. It's a different story, yeah. but she, she talks a lot about like what kind of gear she had to pack with her for an overnight trip. So she, she realized smartly that she needed to bring like an extension cord with some extra outlets right. on it because you don't get very many. And then she tracks the Wi-Fi hotspot that she brought with her versus Amtrak's Wi-Fi to see which ones are Amtrak's holding Amtrak's Wi-Fi is, is horrifically bad. Yeah, it's very slow. It's very yeah. slow. So it's yeah, just, she talks about what she, it provision she can it's do. It's also insecure, she, she points do. out, which is great. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you should yeah, never so hop on that network. She's a security <laughs> writer. She's a security writer. She talks a lot about that in the story too. It's a, it's a really fun story. She wrote a couple of different pieces of related. She has some videos embedded in there. Um, I thought it was a fun story too, just because it really is important to people to be able to get around and be connected, even if they're not working. You still you still want to be connected. Well, as you guys both know, the train systems elsewhere are amazing. The the yeah. bullet train in Japan, the TGV in France. They're quiet, they're comfortable, they're fast. There are lots of them. It's much easier to get around. It breaks my heart that we have such lousy options. I just, I'm just finishing now the Robert Moses biography, Power Broker by Robert Caro. And so we, we had to read that at Columbia. Taylor, did you go to J school at Columbia? I don't remember. I didn't go to journalism no. school. Um, they, in journalism school, that book, they make you read that book. As you should. Um, greatest biography yeah. Ever the first week, but one of the it's a long book. It's sixty hours on Audible. I don't can't imagine. And I bought the book because I thought, well, I just want to see the paper. Yeah. And it's this. And the truth is, there was a great documentary just came out, which you should see. Turn every page about Robert Caro and Bob Gottlieb, his editor, working on that book. And they had to cut out hundreds of thousands of words because it you couldn't bind a book any thicker than it already is. It is as thick as it can be. But the reason I bring it up is this guy Moses was a bad man. And one of the things, you know, the, he built all of the New York freeways, the Trans Bronx Expressway, the Henry Hudson Parkway, everything, all the bridges. He built it all because he wanted to be Caesar, I think. He wanted to be Augustus and have his name everywhere. But he hated mass transit to the point that they built the bridges to, to, into, on the parkways 11 feet high, too low for a bus, because he didn't want anybody on would ride a bus like black people to come to their beaches. And then they had a study, New York City did a study in the 60s. They said, you know, since you're building the parkway, you could put a, a train line right in the middle there. It would cost you just a few pennies more per mile. And Moses said, absolutely not. He hated mass transit. So New York is saddled with basically permanent traffic jams. Because of this guy. And, and of course, he racistly plowed through city after city. It's a brilliant book. It is so good. And I'm sorry it's so long because I think that probably puts off some people. The audio book. Is that, is, oh, go ahead. I did the audio book version of that. I listened. And it's I, great, I isn't it? Great. Yeah. And the, and the guy who's reading it is such a deep voice. You can listen at one and a half. And it's, it's, it's pretty good. Then it's only 40 hours. Isn't that nice? If you're interested in the future of transit, there's an awesome woman at uh, NYU. Her name is Sarah Kaufman, and she writes about future of transit, current transit issues. Um, we could have been super, super so much farther ahead because not only did he ruin New York, but he influenced Los Angeles and every other city. They all thought this guy's the city planner par excellence. Let's just do it like Moses is doing it. And it is so sad. It is so sad what we lost um, and I wish Amtrak were better. Um, I do too. Yeah. It could be. It, it could still be can be. It's not over. Biden put a lot of money into Amtrak, I remember. I hope, the, hope we see the results of that. 
I know you want to get, get stretching, so let me just uh, wrap up with a couple of uh, RIPs. We like to do these at the end so as not to bring people down. The guy who created PowerPoint, Dennis Austin, passed away at the age of 76. Uh, he retired at Microsoft in 1996, created PowerPoint uh, for his own uh, company. Microsoft bought them. And uh, uh, whether you like PowerPoint or not, <laughs> uh, you you can blame uh, you can blame him. I think there was a lot that PowerPoint did that was quite amazing. Dennis Austin passed at seventy six, a real pioneer. And then uh, because we're we've got Taylor on here, I also wanted to mention uh, another uh, legend in the um, internet space who just passed away and is much. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, much, <laughs> much mourned uh, Molly Hoshla Holschlag, who was, as some say, the, the godmother, the fairy godmother of the web, uh, died very young. She was a pioneer of online design and accessibility and a proponent of open web standards, who was really important uh, in promoting the open web. Uh, she had uh, health issues, a series of illnesses over the last decade, um, passed away on uh, Tuesday. So a couple of names I, I think deserve to be remembered. And now you go and you stretch your hamstrings, young lady. Thanks. It's my, it's my TFL, which is like... Oh, my right TFL. Mm. We go, so you, you go to the same stretch place I go to. Probably not the exact same one, Leo, because I'm on a different coast, but <laughs> spiritually, yes. I love it. I go in there and I just lie back and they stretch you. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> huh? it's a, yeah, I can't see. PT prescriptions are too challenging to get at this point. So I've just, I got a guy at this other place. I got so. a guy. Uh, got it's a guy. fantastic. Anyway, I want you to get stretching. Everybody, Amy Webb, the Future Today Institute at futuretoday.com. Uh, anything, do you do a podcast? Anything else you want to plug? Um, just, I will just say, yeah, Phoebe Waller bridge, um, whoever's listening, if you have the ability, just give her all the money and let her oh, make all the stuff. I love her. She so did I'll plug Phoebe Waller bridge. She did my, uh, she was discovered at the Edinburgh fringe festival with a uh, flea bag, which was a wonderful series. But she's also did Killing Eve, and she was in James. Oh, she did James Bond. She does the new James Bond. She wrote. What is right? She's what's a, the latest? She's a brilliant. Um, she was in Indiana Jones. She's got a bunch of stuff in development once the writer strike is done. So she's just oh, that's a right. We won't see brilliant. anything from her for a while. But that's good. She's amazing like crazy. storyteller. So I agree. All, that is that is you know I plug that and you know blueberries for antioxidants. <laughs> I love your plugs, and I will plug your book. The Genesis Machine, which is not only a fun read, is a very, uh, it's an eye-opening. See, there's even an eye on the front. An eye-opening. An, eye. an eye-opening read, yep. a must-read. Thank you, Amy. It's great to see you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Jill Duffy, PC Magazine. Her book, The Everything Guide to Remote Work. Her column at PCMag.com. Her reportage. Do you do a podcast? No, <laughs> I'm off the social media. I'm off the extra work. I'm shedding. I'm well, shedding it all. Let me ask you. I, can, I, can I do a crazy plug? My plug is going to be take a picture of your bike key. Yes. Take that picture. Good it's plug. It's as important as backing up your computer. Take that bike key picture. If you ever need to get your bike <laughs> off the rack and you or lose your key. call me and I'll come over with a hammer, a hammer. and a <laughs> can of compressed air. It's a pleasure, Jill. Anytime you want a podcast, you come here. We love having you on. Thank you so much for being here. You got here. it. Right. Taylor Lawrence's new book is extremely good. It's called Extremely Online, and it is so fun to read this history. People I've forgotten about, uh, stories I never knew, the story of Vine. I do hope somebody excerpts that, although what I really hope is people will just buy your book at extremelyonlinebook.com and read it and the whole thing. It's, was it hard to write or fun to write? Um, well, I've never written a book before, so I made every mistake I could make. And I think the next one will be probably more fun to write. <laughs> yeah, I've written, well, I have 13 books with my name on them. I only wrote the first few. And then I finally, I figured I had to palm them off on other people. It was the worst. It never got better. The worst experience of my life. And the sad thing is nobody buys books anymore. <laughs> Especially technology I know. books. <laughs> I know. So, but you well, do it. 
because it gives you credibility. It gives you street cred, right? Speaking of that, they were like, you know, maybe we position your book as more like pop culture, you know, because like those are the books that are selling. And right. I'm like, maybe. It is pop culture. It's the history of our modern culture. Are you going on book tour? I am. Uh, yeah, just a few places. Uh, it'll, I'm putting the dates on extremelyonlinebook.com. I'll be in New York, uh, D.C., San Francisco, Boston, a few other places. Where are you going to be when you come to San Francisco so I can go see you? TBD, actually, that uh, they've been talking to a bunch of places and they have to work it out. But so I'm telling you, Book Passage, Book Passage is the best. That's where people go. The best people go to Book Passage. I'm just telling, okay. I know you have an agent's going to figure it all out for you. But you can see her at The Strand, October 2nd in New York City, Politics and Prose in D.C. on October 7th, and Book Soup in L.A. on October 13th. Extremely online. Are they making you do interviews, too? I'm doing, I want to do interviews. I'm very excited to talk about my book because it <laughs> took me two years, so. Oh, man. The untold story of fame, influence, and power on the internet. Taylor, I've been trying to get you on this show forever. You're, I read you religiously. I, I read you in the New York Times. I read you in the Washington Post. You do the best job. If I want to know what's going on with the youngs, I read Taylor Lorenz. I thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, about 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. If you want to watch us do it, you can. We leave all the bad words in. If you watch live.twit.tv, that's where the live audio and video streams are. If you're watching live chat live, our IRC is open to all. Just use your web browser, point it to irc.twit.tv. If you're in the club, of course, you can just go to our Club Twit Discord, which is a great hang, uh, not just during the shows, but all the time. Uh, if you're not a member, please join. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. Your support makes a big difference to uh, keeping this show on the air. 18 years we've been doing this thing, 18 plus, and I want to keep doing it for another 18 years. Thank you for joining us. Go to the website if you want uh, episodes at twit.tv. You can also see a YouTube channel dedicated to This Week in Tech. And, of course, you can always search for Twit in your favorite podcast client and subscribe. won't cost you anything, and you'll get it the minute it's available. So you'll have a nice Monday morning commute. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Another Twit is in the can. Bye-bye. amazing. 